everybody. Welcome to Try This Today. I'm Al Roker, and of course, you know, my fellow third hour co hosts. Well, we're always trying something new, and we wanted to set out just to do that. Chanel taking on a dance aerobics class, Dylan Dreyer making a custom handbag, Craig Melvin trying his hand at woodworking, and all four of us checking out a boozy candle making class. But first, I stopped by a local gem in my own neighborhood that's been part of New York City's Upper East Side for almost 100 years. I'm talking the Lexington Candy Shop, where their famous Coke float recently went viral on TikTok. And I got the chance to find out how it's made. You ready for the Coke float? I'm ready. All right, go in there. That's the Coke float place. Coke floats, Coke floats for everybody, yeah! At nearly a century old, the Lexington Candy Shop has stood at the corner of Lexington and East 83rd Street since 1925. Founded by Soterius Phyllis, a Greek immigrant, his son Pete joined the family business in 1930. Not much has changed over the years, except now people are lining up just to get in. And you'll find John behind the counter, the third generation Phyllis, who now owns the business with his partner, Bob Karcher. Your father was here, your grandfather's here. Did you think you were gonna end up running the place? I started working here when I was 14. Now it's 2023, and I'm still here. I, I like it, you know? I like the food, I like the customers, and the environment. How did it get named the Lexington Candy Shop? Because you, you don't really sell that much candy. No, but when my grandfather started in 1925, they were making candies downstairs. And a lot of the Greeks went into the candy business, and we did too, and that was it. You walk in and there are regulars. I mean, what keeps people coming here to the Lexington candy shop? The ones that come every day, we know them. We don't have Wi-Fi because we want people to talk. These days, both regulars and new customers are talking even more about the iconic luncheonette's Coke floats. I can see what everyone waits for. After popping on social media, this post alone went viral with 45 million views. Wow, beautiful. Within the hours, people were coming here, the next day went viral. And I'm a star. <laughs> we're, we're both stars right here. <laughs> John says that the luncheonette used to sell on average about 50 of these sweet treats a week. How many are you making now? A week? Probably about a thousand. Wow. I live in the neighborhood and I'm I'm walking around. Well, I see these lines. What has that been like for you guys? Besides the fact it's, it's stunning, <laughs> it's very tiring, but we like it. For two years with COVID, we were trying to get through it. Now we got it, we're here, and we're making up for it, so to speak. We used to get one shipment of ice cream a week. Now we're getting three or four. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit, I don't think I've ever had a Coke float. Can you show me how you make a Coke float? That's what you're gonna do. We're doing it together. We're ready to go. Time to head straight to the pint for the scoop. Oh, this is the way that we were doing it 100 years ago. Wow. All right, I think I remember that. First, John giving yes. me a quick tutorial. Three, three four, 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 five, five six. six. And you're stirring while you do it. Vanilla. Of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, nice little plop. Now it's my turn. Glass. I pump the Coca-Cola syrup into a glass. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then add seltzer and stir. Oh, he's good. Look at this. Next, ice cream. Mm -hmm. Finally, I top it off with a spritz of seltzer. <laughs> That's living. Now to a place where candy and history meet, the oldest continually running candy shop in Philadelphia. I got the chance to go behind the scenes and learn another skill, how to make a chocolate bar. For over 150 years, Shane Confectionery, the country's oldest continuously operating candy store, has stood here. Established in 1863, the shop was just one of many candy businesses in Philadelphia, but none standing the test of time quite like Shane's. Has it always had the name Shane's out front? No, it was owned by Daniel S. Dangler and W.T. Westcott, both uh, confectioners in the trade. And then by 1911, Edward Shane took over and his family owned it for 99 years. Wow. So. In 2010, the Shane family sold the sweet spot to brothers Ryan and Eric Burley, 
Because this is kind of a turn of the century candy shop, do you always dress the parts? Wearing the bow ties also doesn't get caught in the machinery. Preserving Shane's became a labor of love for the brothers, restoring everything from the floors to the decades old candy making equipment. It was really a jewel that needed to be polished. And we were just astounded by the beauty of the place and the fact that they were still making chocolates here. Why was it important to keep the name Shane? They had been here for nearly 100 years. It didn't feel natural for us to impose our own name or some other name. How much responsibility do you feel in carrying on the tradition of this really historical name here in, in Philadelphia? I think part of uh, the, the history and calling uh, for carrying out confectionery is having roots in integrity of how they used to do it. Those candy-making traditions alive and well upstairs above the shop, where Shane's chocolates are handcrafted from bean to bar by a team led by head chocolate maker Kevin Pascal. Do you dream about different kinds of chocolate bars, like thinking about what's the next chocolate bar? And we get inspiration all the time from all kinds of different things. You kind of think about how you can translate these things into like a confectionery experience. So you're gonna show me how to make a bar? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Get your mold ready, okay. press the pedal, slide the mold all the way to the back, okay. let the chocolate deposit. After a few tries. This is what our finished bar looks like here. And this bar is etched in the exact same way that that chocolate maker used to make chocolate here on this block, Benjamin Jackson. And then this is the back, topped with our sea salt and our peppercorn. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's very unique. Today, the shop, still an homage to the past by making clear toy candy, a rare seasonal sugary treat dating back to the 1800s. Mark, I've, I've never heard of of clear toys when it comes to candy. What is that? It's a Pennsylvania German tradition. It's uh -huh. candy statues at the end of the day. We have 1,200 molds, and they're all very, very old Victorian designs. So how do you do this? Because uh, it, it's, it's like molten sugar. So what could possibly go wrong? A lot. <laughs> In fact, weather is a huge factor when making clear toys. It needs to be cold, and it needs to be dry. If it's really anything else, you get sticky product, you get cloudy product. All right, and now we wait. After about 30 minutes, time to pour some sugar. You're doing great, you're natural. But I learned quickly, this is not so easy. It's delicate sugar, it'll break in your hand. Then we crack open the molds and see my clear toy creations. I'd like to give you a hand. Maybe we'll call this one Owl Roker. Ah, well, when they made me, they broke the mold. My work here is done. Oh, that was a tasty trip. Well, coming up, Chanel meets the force of nature behind a step aerobics class that's taking Atlanta by storm. And later, Craig's first attempt at woodworking. Did that go wrong? We'll find out. Welcome back to Try This Today. Our third hour co-host, Chanel Jones, as you know, is known for her dance moves. For her Try It Challenge, she decided to take a hip-hop aerobics class that put even her dance skills to the test. 
one night, I'm scrolling through Instagram as I do before I go to bed, and I stumble across this step class. And I'm like, oh, I wanna find this guy. And here I am. Just one video, and I was hooked. That is EJ Houston, and every Thursday night, he turns his gym into a step aerobics dance floor. Tell me about Get Down, Stay Down. Where did this come from? The motto is you get the weight off and you keep it off with like extreme movement, having fun. I flew down to Atlanta to see it for myself, and in the process, learned that EJ has a powerful story fueling his upbeat workouts, having tragically lost his mom when he was just eight years old. When I tell somebody that, they instantly pay attention because they're going through things at home, they're going through things with their parents, going through things at work, and it's like, okay, how is this person that has all of the same stuff going on keeps leveling up? by refusing to stay down and sad. Instead, EJ focused his energy into his dreams as an athlete and ultimately a personal trainer. Your passion, your energy just, it comes across. I just met you and I feel it. My purpose is to just help people. Wanting to help more than just one person at a time, EJ made a commitment to motivate others who may be going through struggles of their own. He started teaching group step classes and knew there was only one way to get people in the door, by throwing a party. So if somebody walks into your class, what will they see? Fun, people releasing, people that may be going through pain and they're at least having a good time for that one hour. Those people make up the hundreds of folks who show up both in person and online week after week. So this series is called Try This Today. Mm -hmm. Why should someone give Step a chance? It's just a fun way to just move, and that's all that Step Aerobics is about. You can do it fancy, but if you get on it, you can just get on and off and on and off to the beat. It's actually fun. It looked fun, and I was there to learn from the man himself. But my morning TV job kept me from staying to take his nighttime class. So EJ brought together a group of his best steppers to help show me the moves. So tell me, what do you say to motivate everybody? One band, one sound. What do you mean by that? One person messed up his routine, we gotta start it over. Is he tough love? Yeah. I'm tough on everybody. He doesn't come up and give you a little hug? Oh, no. No. <laughs> All right, I'm ready to learn. All right. Okay. So the first move, okay? Okay. We're gonna say, one, two, three, four, boom, knee. One, two, three, four, boom, knee. Right. <laughs> Second move, we're starting to the left side again. Take, Take it, it back. back. Boom, knee, knee kick, kick, knee. knee. Yeah. Now the yeah. other side. Yeah. Wasn't that the most encouraging, like, whatever? Knee, kick, kick knee. knee. That's it. Clap it up. The third and final move, step, step over, over, step, back, step, over, boom, knee. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look, one okay. band. One sound. Yep. Guess who's in the band? <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> Finally, it was time to put it all to music. Okay. You ready? Let's go. Knee, kick, step, step, over, step, back, step, over. No surprise, Chanel was incredible. Well, now it's Dylan Dreyer's turn, learning how to make her very own bag in one afternoon, and it might inspire you to get crafting as well. As the saying goes, behind every woman is a fabulous purse. And although we all have our own baggage. That is in Dylan Dreyer's wow. bag? This bag is oh. I just had to try my hand at making handbags. This is Anthony Luciano's studio, right here in Manhattan's Garment District. Anthony has been a leather craftsman and admired accessory designer for nearly 25 years. What is it about handbags that you like? I say handbags are a piece of art with a handle. Who have we seen carrying your bags? Meryl Streep has carried something at the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Judith Light is a really great client. Today, he's putting me to work for one of his sip and stitch classes. So what kind of accessories will people make at a sip and stitch class? Usually we make a really simple little card case. Then we do a little simple 
crossbody wallet. But for today, we're gonna do something special. We're gonna do this larger bag. Oh, nice. Yep. I need a new bag. Everybody needs a new bag. <laughs> cheers to a sip, and then you'll teach me how to stitch? Yes, cheers okay. to yeah. I love, I love it. it. First, we picked out fabrics. So you're gonna need to figure out what you'd like for the outside first. Okay. This I is just like intriguing. And my grandmother is... was obsessed with roosters. Or do I go with something more practical, more every day? That yeah. matches all my outfits, but that's not fun. Okay, but right, that's a little boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna steer you away from boring. Let's go wild, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. What kind of material do you look for for the inside of a bag for longevity? I usually use suede. It does wear really well. So these are the colors you want. A pop of color. Yeah, I think so. Beautiful wine color. This looks nice. It right. changes the whole it vibe. It changes the whole vibe. This is nice, nice too, because it does pick up some of the greens mm -hmm. here. I think I, I kind of like this wine color. I like that too. Yeah. Next, we cut each fabric into a standard purse shape. Fortunately, Anthony has a stencil for that. Very nicely done with your finger placement along oh, the edge. Oh, thank you. I feel like I'm with my son, like, stay in the lines. No. <laughs> Yay, ta -da. Then we glue the inner suede to a filler layer that will give the purse shape and add the exterior leather on top of that. But you want to be even, so not too so much, not, lumpy. not too much, and not too little okay. because you want you don't want any bubbles. Mm -hmm. Take a tool like this. Mm. Just so you that on my face in the morning. Right? It's great. I don't know what it does, but well, I like it. It feels good. It feels good. When everything dries, we punch holes where the grommets and buttons will eventually go. Oh, that's easier than it. Yeah. Squeeze it in there if you can. Cool. And we edge paint so my project wouldn't fall apart at the seams. I'm pretty hot in here, so I'm gonna cool myself down. Soon, it was assembly time. So we're gonna fold these, line up all the holes. And then it just goes together just like that? No way. There you go. There you go. And then and just screw this thing up. up. Oh my in. gosh, yes. We added straps for a crossbody look, and I have to say, I nailed it. <laughs> and voila, my very own one of a kind original. Look at my bag. Oh my God, look how cute that oh my is. Oh gosh, it is so adorable. <laughs> I love it so much. I also want to give you a little cherry on the cake. Ooh. And feel like no one should leave here without a tassel. This bag just keeps getting better, better and better. And better. Dylan, that's your bag, baby. Up next, Craig's first attempt at woodworking. And just wait till you see the finished product. Plus, all four of us get lit with a boozy candle making class. Don't go away.
We are back with Try This Today. Interestingly enough, Craig's always wanted to try woodworking, so he called on an expert to help him nail it. In my line of work, it's easy to get caught up in the news cycle. Hurricane disaster zone in Florida yesterday. You've got to stay plugged in to keep up to date on ever-changing events. Making time for myself can be a bit of a challenge. I do not have a lot of time uh, because of the job. I have two small children. I'd like to think I am committed to growth. I need to acquire new skills. So I decided to try woodworking. Anytime I see like something that's, that's well made out of wood, I always think, wow, it'd be cool to try to make something like that. But I needed some help. Meet Kenan Spiegel, the son of a carpenter. He grew up with hands-on knowledge on how to use tools. I spent most of my childhood around job sites, helping frame houses, um, taking home the scraps and kind of building stuff. He's got a job in finance, but his passion project is a company he started called Westport Woodworks. His garage workshop is his refuge. It's where he built elaborate play sets, like this pirate ship for his young sons. He's also volunteered his talents, constructing personalized play sets for sick children through the Make-A-Wish Foundation. In 2020, he got the idea for his next project. So I was driving with my son, my oldest son, and I was thinking, how cool would it be to build an Adirondack chair for a smaller child? It seemed like the perfect project for me to start on. First, we use the jigsaw to shape the arms of the chair. You're gonna place the board on here, uh -huh. holding it tight, keeping your hands away from the blade. Keenan demonstrates, then it's my turn. Have to clean that one up a little bit. <laughs> clean that one up just a smidge. Just a smidge. Next, we use something called a router to smooth the edges. See that? Now we have a nice round. Oh, wow. Edge. And this one, you can feel the difference. Yeah. So it gives it that nice rounded edge, no sharp corners. My turn. Wow. Much smoother. It's much smoother. To speed things up, Keenan has pre-cut all the pieces we need to assemble the chair. So the, the entire chair is in front of us? Correct. Okay. Our first step is going to be driving some screws in here. And what we're going to do is we're going to attach this piece right like so, just like that. Just like that? Yep. This is, a, this is cathartic. Oh, it is. This is cathartic. We talk as we work about our lives and our families. The minutes slip by, and you can start to see the chair take shape. All right, here it here is. Here we go. Here we go. Yes. There you go. I am now a woodworker. Great not, job. Not really. Great I know. Job. But th th here's the thing. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. And it's also really cool to be able to look and see something that you've created. Yeah, you know this. Working with my hands, learning something new, taking the time for myself. I help build a chair and so much more. I want my kids to be able to like see dad make something. Dad did that. How cool would that be? Try This Today continues after.
We're so glad you stuck around. Chanel, Dylan, Craig, and I recently went to a boozy candle making class, and we'll say it sparked a lot of laughs. It'll all make sense when you see this. Most people use candles to wind down, but for us, it was a good excuse to get out of Studio 1A and Welcome. get Come lit. On, are, you? are you guys ready to re-wax and unwind? Actually, Craig waxed just before we got here. <laughs> I love it. Don't encourage that. My name is Ashley. I am the founder and franchisor of Rewax and Unwind. I understand the wax part, the candle. What's the unwind part? Oh, we're going to be drinking. Oh! <laughs> oh, wow. Our first stop, the fragrance station, to test our senses. So, Craig, what do you think this one is? It smelled uh, akin to vanilla, but it's not. I actually took this from the Spirits and Cocktails. Ooh. And Perfect. Yes. Oh, yeah. Great job, Al. So this one is under the clean category, OK? OK. It is. I know it. It's on the tip of my tongue now, too. Dryer yeah. sheet. Yes. Yeah, like I'm thinking like baby wipes. Baby powder. Oh. Oh. Yes. Very good. Ashley directing us to sniff away and write down our favorite aromas. Oh, I hate hazelnut. Oh, Ooh, this is nice. Smell this, moonflower. I like that. You know what? I'm surprised that I picked Axe Body Spray. It's like, <laughs> oh my god, that was so bad. Almost bubble gummy to me. Honeysuckle, moonflower. Yeah. Smells like um, deodorant. As Ashley got our next station ready, we uncorked and unwind. Toast to the nonsense people. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, what, what, look at you. What did you say? To the nonsense people. Yeah, sense. Makes sense. Yes. Very smart. Cheers. Wow, that was very nice. After we settled on our four fragrances, it was time to combine them at the candle making station, creating oh, oh. our signature scents. I've got the Sequoia English Oak, Bourbon, I've got Moonflower, and Old Library Books. Oh, you like smoky, dusty. I do, kind of like me. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, fine. I've got Fraser Fur. Okay, very Christmassy. I've got Jasmine, Clean Linen. And Axe Body Spray. Would you yeah. pick Dylan? Clean Linen, Sea Breeze, Vanilla, and Cucumber. I think I had Citra, oh, Citra, Fraser Fur, Old Library, Grapefruit. So we're going to determine how we're going to find our signature scent. The lids are already open for you. All you're going to do is say, does zucchini blossom go well with sandalwood rose, as an example? And you're going to move ah. your head back and forth. Oh. And puff. Yes. There you go. Mm. So the beakers, this is where the magic happens. You're literally going to go drop by drop until you get to 20 milliliters, OK? So you're going to say a little bit of zucchini blossom, a little bit of cinnamon. Okay. And you're going to use your stirring utensil here. Stir and let your nose lead you to what you want to add next. Uh, I was trying to be polite, but Dylan smells like Robitussin. <laughs> so maybe it needs more vanilla. <laughs> That's not that bad. That smells like you have the flu. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I love it. You like that? Very masculine, but sweet. Much like, like yourself. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's sweet. I like I it a lot. I for on that one. Okay, here we go. Now that's just kind that's of a nice fresh. clean citron gourmet. Wait, I want out. Next, out. Next, we poured hot wax into our mixtures along with colored dyes and some special adornments. Once our candle creations dried, it was the moment of truth. So here are your candles, guys. What do you think? Listen, I <laughs> buy Owls. Yes. I love mine. Like, I, I, this is really, really awesome. It's rare that I say this, but I choose Craig's. Oh, I give you my Oh, I love the glitter on top. All in all, I think you'd agree. It was a sensational day to buddy up. Well, Cheers. Here's to these fantastic things. Each one different and each one special. Aww. Just like all of you. Oh. Wow, that was so sweet. I can't wait to give this to someone as a Christmas gift. <laughs> oh, very nice. By the way, Rewax and Unwind is franchising, so keep an eye out for one in your neck of the woods. We had a lot of fun trying these new activities, and we hope you'll get creative and try something new. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Al Roker. See you next time on Today All Day. The rush of the water, the thrill of the catch. For many, fishing isn't just a hobby or a career, it's a lifestyle. In the US, women account for roughly 10% of commercial fishermen, but they've long played a vital role in the global seafood industry. 
I'm Elena Besser. As a chef, recipe developer, and content creator, I'm always hungry to learn more about the people who keep our food systems running. So I'm heading out to meet two women making waves in the fishing world and creating more space for everyone at the table. Welcome to the lush forests, expansive beaches, and pristine rivers of Washington State's Olympic Peninsula. Pacific Coast Indigenous peoples have called these bountiful lands their home for millennia. The Quinault Indian Nation is one of many tribes that fishes, hunts, and forages here. As a non-native, I'm fortunate to be invited to the Quinault Reservation by fishing guide and tribal member, Ashley Lewis. When I think about the rivers, the oceans, the lakes out here. What I think about is home. Ashley comes from a long line of Native Americans who fished these waters for years. In the 1850s, many tribes were forced to give up their land for white settlements, but they retained fishing and hunting rights on traditional lands. During the 1960s, as Washington State began infringing on those rights, Native Americans staged a series of protests known as fish-ins. These protests led to a landmark Supreme Court decision that protects Native fishing rights to this day. One activist at the forefront of that movement was Janet McLeod, dubbed the Rosa Parks of the American Indian Movement. Her advocacy has inspired generations of Indigenous trailblazers, including my guide. When they were forced to cede their land for newcomers, their waterscapes, the rivers, the lakes. It makes so much sense that that was the thing that's like, no, we have to have this because it's so essential to who we are. Quinault tribal members have exclusive hunting and fishing rights on a portion of this river. I couldn't wait to see Ashley's favorite fishing spots with the help of fellow guides Ruben Estevio and John Tater Bryson. If you want to think like a fish, just think like a really lazy person. Great. Like, what is going to be the easiest thing to do? Uh huh. Is it, do you want to go up that fast water? Not really. You right. want to kind of be in like the slow, easy water. Time for a quick casting lesson. We're just going to swing straight back and then we're going to swing straight forward. You can kind of feel when the current catches it. Okay. Go ahead and give it a shot. That was a good cast. Thank that was you. a great cast. That's high praise coming from Ashley, who's been a guide here for the past decade. Now she's become something of a celebrity among outdoor enthusiasts, amassing a large following on social media where she goes by the handle Bad Ash. Her YouTube and Instagram pages are chock full of how-to videos and inspiring content from her many outdoor adventures. Can you explain to me some of the, you know, stereotypical experiences that you have had that have been a little bit tough as a female fisherman in this community? Being a woman in a male-dominated sport poses challenges. Some people want me to stay in a lane that isn't my lane. I would like to see the outdoor industry be more welcoming to women. I would like to see it be more welcoming to women of color and people of color. I feel really proud to get to chip away at that on my own terms. There we go. Reconnecting with the Quinault and their fishing traditions has been a journey for Ashley. She grew up removed from her tribe, living an hour off the reservation with her mom and two siblings. I grew up in a really small community, moved to a smaller community, one stop light in town sort of deal. And you had two options. You um, get in trouble or you go fishing. Okay. And I picked fishing. <laughs> I love it. And why did your mom choose to raise you off of the reservation? She experienced a lot of adversity as a younger woman and as a Native American woman. And so some of that adversity caused her to be really protective of her kids. And she wanted us to love our culture. The Quinault are a matriarchal society. Women serve as the head of the household and often take on tribal leadership roles. The women here also help with traditional food gathering. Ashley grew up fishing with her mom, but didn't always appreciate the cultural meaning behind these trips. Tell me a little bit about how you met your tribal family. So about the time that I got a driver's license and I could take myself fishing, <laughs> things really changed for me. <laughs> and so I would kind of drive out to the reservation, explore a little bit, being out there among other Quinaults, fishing for salmon, that's everything that I needed. Yeah. And so that moment was profound to me. John Tater Bryson, one of the first professional guides she met on the reservation, soon became her mentor. I was taught from a young age how to harvest 
elk and deer and fish. And it's passed on to the younger people, so the tradition will keep going. I think I got something. Oh, you definitely do. What a cutie. Oh, hey, my guy. Bye. Ashley enjoys showcasing this beautiful place to new people, but she's also made it her mission to call out the effects of climate change to this land. What we're seeing here, this is a big slide, and we're seeing a lot of this along our river, and this is the effects of climate change. She's currently earning a PhD in Indigenous Studies, with plans to educate people about the tribes of the PNW and the environmental threats they face. With the weather warming, with different rain patterns, it changes the river, but it also changes where fish are going to be spending time. Fishing guides are like an indicator species because we're the ones out in the river day in and day out. We're the ones who see changes happening really quickly. Because of the climate threats to the Quinault, the Biden administration granted the tribe $25 million to help relocate members in flood-prone areas. This is, you know, ancient village sites. This is burial ground sites. And so to see those places washed away, this is a really significant blow to us. Indigenous people are generally the first impacted by climate change, especially if you're situated right on the Pacific Ocean. Sustainability practices are tenets for the Quinault. Three tribal-run fish hatcheries help maintain the populations of salmon and trout species that call this river home. Every spring, millions of salmon and steelhead are released from these hatcheries. So we were a few miles upriver fishing, mm -hmm. but now we're here at the mouth. The Pacific Ocean is right on the other side of our fish house here, and this is where tribal members come and set their nets and commercially fish for blueback sockeye. It's the only place in the world where our blueback sockeye run, so okay, it's an right. incredibly special fish to us. Commercial salmon fishing is a big part of the economy on the res. The most efficient way to get a big catch is by using a method called gill netting. Gill nets are placed near the mouth of the river to catch salmon by the gills as they head upstream. Whoa, double trouble. That's a huge one. As a chef, I've cooked fish many different ways, but this was the freshest catch I've ever tried. Cooking salmon the way her tribe has for generations is a cherished pastime for Ashley, who celebrates her culture through food. The fish is a really wonderful, tasty, oily fish, mm -hmm. and we just want to highlight the greatness that already lives here. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. The flavor that we're going to give it really is going to come from the alder fire and the cedar sticks. After the fish is on the pole, it's supported with cedar sticks woven across the filet. The salmon cooks until it turns light pink, another five minutes, then it's ready to serve. So now we can enjoy ourselves some Quinault fish sticks. Let's do it. Oh my gosh. Mm. I'm never ever going to look at a normal fish stick ever again in the same way. <laughs> comes right off of that skin. It really doesn't need anything else. Let the food shine. Absolutely. Yeah.
after an incredible day of catching and cooking fish on the Quinault River, it was time for a trip to the beach. At sunrise, my guide Ashley Lewis and tribal biologist Scott Mazzoni are ready to show me another local pastime, digging for razor clams. Can you tell me a little bit more about what we're doing today? We are getting ready to have uh, uh, home use digs, subsistence digs, and commercial digs of razor clams. And before we do that, we got to go out and get clam samples and test them to make sure there's no toxins in them and they're self, uh, safe for people to eat. Pacific razor clams are a meaty shellfish with an oblong shell. They can grow up to six inches. They're also a delicacy here and a major part of the quinault diet. So we're gonna use these spade tempered shovels. They're kind of curved in a way that makes it easy for us to dig the clams. Great. So we're gonna head out to the surf. We're gonna look for clam shows. As we walk towards the surf, Ashley points out small holes and dimples in the sand. These are known as clam shows, evidence that razor clams are just beneath the surface. That looks like a good spot. Whoa! There we are. Down here they have their foot and that they can use to dig very quickly down into the sand. Hey. He's like, I'm out of here. Thank you and goodbye. Ooh. I gotta tell you, even though it's 5 a.m., all of this razor clam digging is making me extremely hungry and ready to eat them. And they are as delicious as they are fun to dig. <laughs> It was finally time for me to see what all the fuss is really about. At nearby Ocean Crest restaurant, razor clams are a menu staple. Head chef Amanda Yeager has prepared a few of their signature dishes made with fresh local clams. On the menu, a panko crusted razor clam steak served with pickled onions and a chili aioli. There's also a razor clam omelet plus a flatbread topped with Amanda's house-made razor clam sausage. Mmm, there's a common misconception with large clams, you know, oh, would it taste rubbery, but this does not at all. That's a lot of how it's treated. It's, you know, low and slow heat, and that's why they maintain their flavor and their texture. Respect. Wow. So much. Everyone knows and loves a chicken cutlet. This is so tender on the inside. You're getting an amazing, crisp exterior. That crunch and acidity coming from the onion, it is the perfect bite. As my time on the Quinault land comes to a close, I'm already sad to leave this incredible place. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you could say one thing to the people that are watching this, what, what would you want them to know? about you and about this community. My very favorite piece about guiding is not actually the fishing. It is the way that it changes the way people start seeing the natural world. It could tell a lot about history. It could give you a lot of information. But I do know from my experience that when people are there and experience it, they're going to become curious. And that's what I want the most.
When it comes to high-end seafood, lobster is pretty much king. Maine is the largest lobster producer in the country, with catchers here harvesting over 100 million pounds of the crustacean every year. I've just always admired the fishermen, and to even be able to say that I'm a fisherman just means so much to me. Sadie Samuels is the only female commercial lobster boat captain in the small town of Rockport. Her day starts before sunrise when she buys bait for her traps. Hi. Hey, Sadie. Welcome. Oh, it's so great to find you. Look at this stunning place of work. Are you kidding? With its rocky underwater terrain and cool waters year round, the Gulf of Maine is a perfect home for lobsters. Hi, guys. The lobster industry here generates over $1 billion for the state. But those big bucks aren't made easily. Fishing for lobsters is one of the most dangerous professions. The fatality rate is 2.5 times the national average. Can you tell me a little bit more about how dangerous this job actually is? It's one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. The first funeral I ever went to was one of the fishermen in my harbor who went out by himself and he got rope, like, die on, so he on drowned. lobster. Yes, he drowned. Why do you stay in this despite all of the pain and dangers that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis? I literally never imagined doing anything else with my entire life. Sadie's passion for fishing stems from her childhood. Her father, Matt Samuels, has been catching lobsters for over 60 years. He was up before sunrise and out the door, and then he'd get home and he'd just work until dark and come in and eat dinner and pass out. So the only way I could really hang out with him was if I wanted to like get involved with what he was doing. And then I just stuck around and I never left. <laughs> When she was just seven, Sadie got her student lobster license. She began working right away, dropping a couple traps off her dad's boat for extra cash. By age 14, she saved enough money to buy the boat she still fishes with today. I don't think I fully considered that it was like my career or gonna be my career until a little bit later in life, until I was like 14, 15. I love how you said later in life when I was about 14. I just, <laughs> I just started getting serious about it. You were 14. That is hilarious and amazing. After studying art in college, Sadie quickly returned to a life at sea. Like when I'm out here, I'm just like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Today, Sadie doesn't just catch lobsters, she also dishes up fresh lobster rolls at her seat table restaurant, also named Must Be Nice. I would like you to walk me through your day from start to finish, so lay it on me. <laughs> so my average day is waking up around four o'clock, quarter to four, go to the boat, and then we haul about 250 traps, crate up the lobsters that we're bringing over to the restaurant, and then the restaurant closes at seven. In Maine, just 15% of lobster licenses are held by women. But anyone who catches lobsters is called a lobsterman, which Sadie stands behind. How do you feel about the term lobsterman? I'm very much on the side of like, I'm a fisherman, I'm a lobsterman. I've busted my butt and paid my dues. Nothing I do really has to do with my gender. Maine fishing laws have strict limits on the number of traps new lobstermen can set. Over time, they can acquire more traps, but it can take several years to make a livable wage. How did you get savvy with making sure that you could function as a successful business? That's actually how I started Must Be Nice Lobster, is on Saturdays, someone was looking for someone to sell lobsters at a farmer's market. I started selling live lobsters there and then now we're here. The trap limits are part of Maine's successful conservation efforts. In the 90s, there were around 37 million pounds of lobster in the Gulf of Maine. Today, it's nearly 120 million pounds. Fishermen actually were the ones who started to put a lot of those practices in place. Those regulations impose strict sizing guidelines. Sadie actually throws back many of the lobsters she catches. That one will be good next year. Small lobsters are too young for sale, while many older, large lobsters get thrown back to breed. So this is a, a big hard shell female. You can see on her, if you turned her the other way, She's it's the second to right swimmerette has this mutilation on it. Got it. Which means that 
someone else has caught her before with eggs on it. A keeper lobster has a body that measures between three to five inches. It can take a lobster about seven years to reach that size. Finally, a lobster that was just right. Look at those claws. Nice male. Really gorgeous lobster. He's definitely a keeper. Yeah. You're coming home with us, babe. Climate change is making these size regulations more crucial than ever. The Gulf of Maine is one of the Earth's fastest warming bodies of water, which can make lobsters more vulnerable to disease and less likely to reproduce. Why is sustainability so important to you? We're so connected with nature and so connected with our environment that it like feels like our duty. At Sadie's restaurant, she's dedicated to sourcing her ingredients sustainably. The lobster chowder uses a seafood stock made from an invasive crab species. And she's adding a new locally raised item to the menu. This season we're adding in oysters and I'm super excited because we're trying to focus as much as we can on female owned farms and also the quality of the seafood is like outstanding. To get a sneak peek at her new menu offering, Sadie took me to meet farm manager Bonita Johnson at Wright Cove Oyster Farm. So tell me a little bit more about these oysters. We're a small operation here, and so we do kind of everything by hand. Wow. And uh, yeah, they're raised with love. You and, can taste it. And yeah, <laughs> you really can. Do you want to try one real quick? Um, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I've been waiting <laughs> over here. <laughs> Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. These wow. are hands down some of my favorite oysters mm. ever. So <laughs> clean, but briny. I've never had anything like this before. I'm blown away. You don't do anything in the working waterfront type of industry unless you have passion for it. Mm -hmm. And that's a really nice thing for us to like get to share with each other. Yeah. This is definitely my happy place. Back at Must Be Nice, Sadie is steaming our catch before picking meat for her signature lobster rolls. Hey, fresh caught, fresh cooked. I just had to know the secrets behind the Sadie sauce lobster roll. So how did you come up with the sauce? So I've had plenty of people, you know, from away say that Maine's lobster rolls are really boring. And I kind of took offense to that. I was yeah. like, you know what? I gotta come up with something that like packs a punch, has a bit of a spice. It starts with shallots, celery, and parsley blended in a food processor. Sadie then adds a not so secret blend of dried herbs and spices. Can you reveal what's it's in this spice It's mainly blend? paprika. The spicy part is cayenne. A mix of lemon juice and rice wine vinegar kick up the acid. And then there's a generous squeeze of stone ground mustard. Now we just add in the rest of this olive oil and then I'm gonna blend it for a little while until that just seems totally incorporated. There we go. 
Ooh, that is gorgeous. And that is the Sadie sauce. Sadie packs each toasted bun with a hefty handful of lobster meat. Look at this. Are you kidding me? To finish, a sprinkling of homegrown chives. I can't wait to try that. I'm so pumped. Inspired by Sadie's creativity, I wanted to make something special, a lobster BLT. One of my favorite foods in the summertime is a BLT. And mm -hmm. it really screams summer. And also what screams summer is a juicy lobster roll. So I figured they would pair beautifully together. We're starting with cherry tomatoes. And the reason why I sliced the tomatoes first is because I like to hit them with a little bit of salt. Yes, I brought oh, yeah. a little flaky salt. And what this is gonna do is it's really just gonna pull out all those flavors and make them taste as juicy and delicious as possible. This is my best pal, Mayo. I spice up my mayo with grated garlic, the juice and zest of a lemon, black pepper, and chives. It's such an honor to like cook with the lobster that you have caught. So I just <laughs> first of all want to say thank you because this is like the coolest. You are more than welcome. It is my joy. This is a meat lover's dream. So we're going to add two pieces of bacon Woo! on either side. We're then going to take a gorgeous lettuce leaf. And that's like the boat that's gonna catch all that sauce for us. Just add the lobster, cherry tomatoes, and a final sprinkle of chives. Voila. Well, that is gorgeous. And there you go, BLT lobster roll. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh, this might fall Cheers. over Cheers, if it does, it's part of the fun. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> Holy moly. Oh man. This is insane. This Sadie sauce is slamming. Hubba hubba. I'm honestly having a hard time hearing what you're saying because <laughs> I'm having a moment with this one over here. Oh my God. This is literally perfect. Yay. At dinner, I couldn't wait to learn more from the women here who support each other through their passion for fresh local seafood. When people see that this is a sea to table restaurant and then they find out that you ladies were the ones that actually caught and grew the food that is being served here. What do they say to you? I feel like people, they're super excited about it and really happy that they found us. Then they can taste it with the quality of our seafood or they're in complete disbelief in like, okay, yeah, but your dad caught these. So they're literally saying to you, <laughs> No, this is a man's job. Well, I think some people have been a little too sheltered and just haven't gotten to see what us women can do. <laughs> Amen. And it's up to that. us to show them. Honestly, that's Cheers. another opportunity to toast. I love it. Time to dig in. Mm. I'm really into this BLT one. This is going on the menu, by the way. <laughs> Elena's roll. We're gonna call it Elena's roll. Yeah. Ladies, this is a dinner I will never forget, so I truly can't thank you enough for all of your hard work in making this happen, and thanks for hanging out with me. From the smoky salmon of the Quinault Nation to the buttery, sweet lobster of Maine, I'm in awe of our nation's most delicious seafood. But I'm most inspired by the women paving their own paths in this industry and ensuring future generations will have plenty of fish in the sea. Hello and welcome to another fabulous day here on The Boost. We've got a a fun show for you today. A little bit later, Harry Smith pays a visit to a famed restaurant featured on South Park and now owned by the show's creators. First up, the family who went viral for re-wearing their wedding dresses to dinner. Herta sat down with them to hear why they decided to put their gowns to good use. Terry, her four daughters, two daughters-in-law, they went viral for a girls' night out on the town and guess what they did? They just dressed in white. 
More than 5 million people watched that on Instagram. There were captions that read in part, uh, we decided that the most expensive dresses we own deserve to be worn and enjoyed for more than just one day in our lives. And they decided to wear their dresses yet again right here in Studio 1A. Terry, Madeline, Alexis, Annalise, Kate, <laughs> Hannah Joy, and Sydney. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. You started the thing. Okay. <laughs> Take us back to the beginning of this decision. So you guys always do a monthly uh, dinner, the all the girls yeah. in the family. It's the goal to do it monthly. Which yeah. is cool for you. So then how did this idea to come up, come up to like, why don't we just wear our wedding dresses? I think Hannah Joy found a reel. Yeah. Yes. And sent it to our daughter's chat. Okay. And everyone was like, yes. <laughs> so we should do it. And someone said at our next sister date. And that was next week. And we're like, it was okay. Like three days. <laughs> so okay. We all found our wedding dresses, pulled them out, and <laughs> first tried of to all, fit them. <laughs> how awesome that first of all you you still had all your wedding dresses. Most I lost of you, mine, yeah. Terry, yours got <laughs> lost somewhere in the sauce, but you showed up for dinner. Yes. So the reaction must have been super crazy. Tell me what happened in the restaurant, Terry. <laughs> well, I mean, everyone, like, what's going on? Did y'all just get married? Why do you have babies? Where are your husbands? I mean, like the questions were endless. Can we take a picture so with you? Funny. Come on. I mean, like we had. Yes. Did you guys think? Um, Alexis, that this would start some crazy viral movement because what happened was I can't believe the number of hits you guys got on this. Honestly, yeah. I kind of did. I you told did? my husband, he's like <laughs> making dinner, and I'm like, you just watch. This is going to go viral. Yeah, yeah. He's like, it better because you're not helping me make dinner. I was like, okay. All right, where were, Alexis, when you, uh, you, or Madeline, yeah. sorry, Madeline, when you found your wedding dress, um, what did it feel like putting it back on? Because now many of you have children. You've kind of gone to a different phase in life. It was weird. Definitely <laughs> strange putting it on after eight years married and three children. But I felt really beautiful and happy. <laughs> By the way, you have beautiful babies. There are three of them that are just out in the hall. We what, think so too. What did your husbands think overall of this idea that you guys were going to come out here and do this? Yeah, he, I mean, it was fun, like, well, Gray buttoned me in, <laughs> which you is in. like the opposite of your wedding night, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I was like, okay. <laughs> you know what I love about your family? First of all, the fact that you did this is amazing and insane, and I think it's going to be duplicated because the point is, is we do wear wedding dresses one time, and then it goes in a box and locked up. Why are we doing sense. that? I don't know. I mean, there, yeah, there's a million reasons we should wear it and celebrate a lot. But what I love about what you do, Terry, is how many children do you have? Eleven. Okay, yeah. I heard gasps and people <laughs> fainted. You have eleven children. I do. Once a week, you have a family dinner. Correct. Tell me about, because your family's close and doing this cool thing, not because it was a one-off. Okay. It's because you guys spend time together. We Tell do like about together. that. Um, well, we just... We are our support group. Mm -hmm. So we come together once a week and I'm not cooking for them. I mean, sometimes they ha bring things and sometimes I cook, you know, it just alternates as far as the food goes. But the main point is that we are in community with each, 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 with each other, I yeah. can't talk. And um, we just want our kids and my grandkids to grow up together. So. This is so inspiring. Will y'all just give me a little description of your mom? Who wants to give a little description? Yes. Ambitious. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. She's a peacemaker. Yeah. She's a peacemaker? Mm -hmm. Very intentional. She's intentional. Very. So fun. I don't know. Well, She's always so fun. She's God. young and beautiful. It's supposed to be about yeah. me. But yeah. you know what? it is <laughs> fun about you. But you guys, what a beautiful thing you did. I think you started a trend. And not only that, you have great timing. You're here on the Nile Horn Day. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, who wants to go? Do y'all want to go out and see the concert? Yes. Yeah. 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 Who are yeah. the girls in their wedding dress? Kyle's yeah. going to think you're looking at him. Uh, you guys, thank you thank so, you. so much. We appreciate you. you. You're a great so mom, thank uh, you, Terry. Thank I you. want you to write a parenting book. That'll, no. come, that, that'll come later. Well, now we turn to another viral moment. A young man who's wiser than his years, gaining a following for his very mature morning routine. He joined today along with his parents who are teaching him life lessons that we can all learn from. Six-year-old Ion Jump wakes up before his siblings. <laughs> you know why? He wants to enjoy his lemon and honey tea. He wants to read his chapter book. His mom just posted a video. It happens all the time. That video went viral, got nearly 3 million views and counting. Oh, my gosh. One comment said he looks like he's got himself a healthy 401k. <laughs> Another asking, can he be my life coach? Well, yes, he can, because Ion is here along with his parents, Alyssa and Alpha. Hi, Good guys. Morning. Good morning. 
morning. Good morning. Hi, Ion. How are you? I'm good. You are? Now, tell us about your morning routine. Why do you like to take some time to calm down, read, and have your tea? Well, I like to enjoy myself because sometimes when I wake up, and I go to school, I don't have enough time. So that's why I, my mom said that if I finish my morning routine quickly, then I can do a quiet activity. Well, that is so wise, not only of your mommy, but for yes. you to take that advice. I know you have, uh, you got a brother and sister at mm -hmm. home, so it's probably loud once they get up. So you need a little time to yourself. Quiet time. What do you do during your quiet time? What does it feel like? When, when I have my quiet time, I can read a book, drink my tea, or I can play with a toy or any other quiet activity. Okay, okay, talk to me. We're in love you, I, by the way. If my kids what's are watching, here. you're grounded um, forever. Okay, I mean, Alyssa yeah. and Alpha, yeah. this extraordinary child. Yes. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Extraordinary parents uh -huh. as well. Thank How did you. you do this? We would like a step-by-step -step guide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do not have a step-by-step -step guide. But you know, we started um, with reading to Ion really early, mm -hmm. really from the womb. You know, mm -hmm. we've been reading to him, and we it was a uh, an act something that we did at night. Every night we read to him. Um, and so he's just grown to have a love for reading. You know, he looks forward to getting books as a gift. Mm -hmm. He's asking for different books. We introduce him to um, different types of stories and. As far as the tea, that's really dad. Dad drinks yeah. tea. <laughs> so I grew so. up on, uh, I come from a Caribbean household, so I grew up on tea um, every day. And of course, Ion sees me, you know, drinking my tea in the morning. So one day we just introduced tea. Um, he has his own tea. It's special. It's lemon, honey, and water. Uh -huh. It's not, you know, regular tea. So he has his special tea. Well, what's interesting about this is a lot of our kids do like to read, but we can't get them to be calm yes. like this in the morning. <laughs> I think liking this is his nature, you think though. Are you just a calm kind of kid? Yes. You are? For the most part, yeah. Because I mean, he's still a kid. He's still a kid. <laughs> right. But I remember back when we first met Ion, mm -hmm. and he was talking about affirmations. Yeah. And that was something that caught fire. What were the three affirmations he said? You I'm said, smart. I am blessed. I can do anything. You are smart. <laughs> you are blessed. You can do anything. Do, was this something that you just sort of repeated to yes. him? Yes. And then did you actually see it? Manifesting. Yes, him? yes. I taught it to him when he was two. Um, I just yeah. wanted to. Oh, is that it playing? <laughs> That's him. We hear you. Um, yeah. I just wanted him to have something so that he could feel confident and motivated. You know, as he got older. And then the video that you are talking about is when he was three. We were walking to school and he yes. just started saying it by himself. By himself. Yeah. So I just recorded it and you know I posted it. Um, but he says it. I hear him saying it to himself. I don't have to prompt him anymore. If he's having a difficult time, he'll be like, I can do this. I can do anything. <laughs> By the way, you so, wrote a children's working. book, didn't you? Yes. What's it called? Two books yeah. um, yes. with my sister. The yes. first book is called I Am Smart. I Am Blessed. I Can Do Anything. Yes. And the second book is I Am Amazing. Wow. Well, yeah. I think you guys are amazing because Thank here's, you. he's obviously an extraordinary child. And we yeah, all yeah. know if you're parents, it's like they just, they are who they are. Right. You know, <laughs> we, right. we can only do so much. Exactly. But I love that you Get, you trusted him enough mm -hmm. to give him that time to do something that is yes. quite mature. Sometimes yes. I think we underestimate mm -hmm. yes. what our kids can do. Mm -hmm. And you so have obviously, obviously set high expectations that Ion has met. Yeah. yeah. Ion is just a, you know, he's a very special kid. His name means gift from God, and he's truly oh. just been a gift um, to yeah. us since he's been here. He's just an awesome kid. He's just naturally yes. amazing. Ion, uh, do you ever think about what you want to be when you get bigger, when you grow up? Yes, I want to be a scientist when I grow. And I have my own scientist club at school. You my do? friend Peter's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> really? And why do you want to be a scientist? Because I'm going to make a formula that I can rub on people's heads, and that will make them never die. Until a few months, it will fade away. <laughs> Ion, I oh, believe you. Ion, I you do can too. do anything. I do. We have something special for you, Ion. Oh. Would you like to meet our friend? You might okay. remember her. Our friend Jenna is here. Do you oh, remember? Gosh. Do you remember Jenna? Hi, oh. Ion. It's so good to see you. Hi. He doesn't remember, oh, me, but it doesn't matter. He was three. <laughs> Look what I have for you. Look. I know you love to wow. read. Have you ever read Dog Man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
The new this is for you. Me. I love that. And have you ever read Renee Watson? <gasps> Ways to Grow Love? Oh, wow. Something tells me you would love this book. Do you want to read it? Okay, well, all of these are for you, and this is for your tea. Ooh, you have a special oh. cup. <laughs> you're oh, welcome. All right. Oh, well, you're amazing. High five, Ion. You're amazing. High five, Ion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, he's strong, too. <laughs> We've got a fun look at the trivia tide sweeping the nation. You don't want to miss this one. That's right after the break. Welcome back to The Boost. Trivia has overtaken bars all over the country, including right here in New York, as people continue to seek in-person connection and entertainment in the post-pandemic world. Joe Fryer has a little bit more on this latest trend. Ben Affleck and what other actor are both returning as the Cape Crusader in the movie The Flash? If it's Tuesday night, it's trivia night at Lexington Public on Manhattan's Upper East Side. Michael Keaton. Whoa, We've been coming here like pretty much every week. Tuesday night trivia brings me to the bar. I really love pop culture. I love geography, uh, like current events, politics, uh, and sports. Teams like this one meet up weekly for some friendly competition. Gets us out on a Tuesday night, so it's nice to have a, a routine. Owner Chloe Patelis added the trivia night as a way to draw customers to the newly opened bar. And she says it's a winning answer. Tuesday night business is up 50 percent. It's brought in so many people that might not have found this location. NYC Trivia League supplies bars like Lexington Public with equipment, hosts, everything they need to run their own trivia nights, besides the beers and wings. The group has seen a rush of interest post-pandemic and added 24 new trivia nights since November. We've seen more players We've seen them coming back more often. And it's not just a New York City phenomenon. The company King Trivia runs events in about 35 states. They've gone from 200 weekly events before the pandemic to more than 300 now. More different types of venues are open to it today. So the popularity has surged. It's way higher. But it's a, it's a much more difficult landscape today than it was before. It's part of a larger trend combining eating and drinking with entertainment. More than 80% of Americans have tried it out. For customers watching their wallets, it provides added value. While bars get an influx of patrons and improve their bottom line. Before the pandemic, is a trivia night something that would have you would have even considered? I know a lot of bars did it, but that's not something that I would have considered. It's amazing. I would never go back. And if you're looking to add a dose of competition to your nights out, trivia is not the only option. Some places customers can throw an axe in between sips of beer or even play pickleball during happy hour. An event night like this, that's their personal trainer, so they have to go. They have to commit to it. Otherwise, they might have just thought, I'm going to go out tonight. Uh, maybe I'll just stay in and watch TV. You're like a personal trainer. Just like a personal trainer, <laughs> yeah. And the trivia craze even took over today. Let's throw it back to last year when Hoda, Carson, and I 
tested our knowledge on the first seven decades of today's show history. Check it out. We're back with today's trivia special game show celebrating today's 70th anniversary. I'm your host, Al Roker. Now, let's meet our contestants from South Carolina, Craig Melvin from West Virginia, Hoda Kotb, and from California, Carson Daly. Come on, let's go! Good luck to you all. Okay, here we go. First question. Which star's father created the Today Show? Was it Johnny Carson, Jimmy Fallon? What? Andy McDowell? Is this Sigourney real? Wow. I'm going to go with Sigourney Weaver. You got a buzz. I did. He did. Oh, Sigourney right. Weaver. You Sigourney. are correct. What? Sigourney oh. Weaver. Her Look at you. Yes. He created not only the Today Show, but the Tonight Show as well. Wow. All right, we're gonna. This is an audio cue. Let's cue the music for this. Play it. Which iconic Hollywood star sang the song that became the original instrumental version of Today? Carson. Judy Garland. Judy Garland. No. I'm going with Doris Day. Correct. Oh, oh, hey, that's right. What a is so lucky. That's I right. am lucky. I never play pickleball. Then she rules. <laughs> Dave Garraway came up with that. All right, here's a good one for you. This one's for you, Craig. How many U.S. presidents have been interviewed here on today? Wow. Craig, thirteen. You're correct. Wow. Every president since know? President Eisenhower here that's on good. today. Wow. All right, Wait, let's, let's go, go now. Wow. Here comes Carson. This one's for you. All right. Our very first Plaza performance was A. Billy Joel, Ooh. B. Britney Spears, C. Earth, Wind, and Fire, very D. First? Aerosmith. I'll bite. I'll take the bait. It's got to be Earth, Wind, and Fire. Absolutely correct. Go, let's go. Come on. On. And your Wait, favorite band too. Right. Wait, Wait, let's watch for it. Oh, let's relive. Oh, come on. 1995. Broker, was that one of your favorites? Yes, absolutely. Come on. All right. Here we go. A lot of people have been spontaneously spotted stopping by our window, including a president of the United no. States. What? Was it A, Harry Truman, B, Gerald Ford, C, Lyndon Johnson, D, Wait, we had Bill Clinton? Stop by our window uh, in the world. It had to be Clinton. Uh, uh, Craig, Craig. I, I'm going to go with uh, Gerald Ford. No. It's got to be Bill Clinton. No. Uh, it was Harry Truman. Absolutely correct. Wait, Harry what? Truman in 1957 oh, stopped 50. by. Look I was there that morning. Oh, oh, Wait, can you just look at that photo <laughs> look for a second? Now that's amazing that with incredible? his hat on. Oh, I that's why they are tied. So Where's the sign? Up. Where's the right. sign? Okay, here we go. Halloween time. Yeah. Which celebrity oh, yeah. has not been portrayed by a Today anchor on Halloween? Blake Shelton, Katy Perry. Oh gosh. Katy Perry. Perry. Absolutely no, correct. I, I got it. That's good. None of us yet. <laughs> well, you both buzzed in at the same time. I'll Eddie has, you. Cindy has. Okay. Wait, We're coming okay. up on the Olympics, right? Oh, Ready? No. We're okay, flying. Okay, here we go. In 17 days, we'll be... How many Olympics has today traveled to? Okay. He's got, I think Craig? you should complete the, complete the no. question. Okay, how many Let's Olympics... Go ahead, Craig. Got? How go many ahead, Olympic Craig. games have we traveled? Go, 15. Absolutely correct. Wow. That's right. Let it We've go. been at every Wait, Olympics can we pause since for 1992. Wow. Al, since, can we pause for a second? Yeah. What's the score? Uh, uh, I believe three, two, one. No, wait. Hold it three. Got, 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 I have three. two. No, you got two. Carson, two. All okay. right. All okay. Right. I'm not sure about that. The Today right. Plaza had a big role on a popular sitcom. Name the show. Seinfeld, Will and Grace, oh, wow. Friends. It's got to be 30 Rock. Rock. Nope. <gasps> she said lose a point. Uh, uh, Will and Grace. Will and Grace is correct. Oh, let's go. go. Oh. Take a look. We've got a little clip. Well, let's see. Will I want to see. Jack was uh, uh, looking forward to finally seeing a gay oh, kiss on network yeah. TV. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right here. <laughs> Another first from today's show. That's right. He brought it here. Uh, it was based on a true story. How many times has Al Rooker been on a primetime network show? Oh, about 100. 14 uh, times. All of them. Okay. okay. Last question. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's pause. Well, this is like a, a tiebreaker. It's like 3 3 3, maybe. Is right. this 3 3 3, Pete? Might be. Well, let's make it. Okay. Tiebreaker. 3 for Hoda. Is this last question? Carson has three. Craig has two. Oh, okay, okay here we go. Okay, win, here but, we go. But you can tie. Last question. Which is good. How many people have helped the weather job that I am in today? Wow. Craig, I would say only five. Wrong. Hold up. Oh, Carson buzzed in. I'm going to say six. Carson is incorrect. So now I have a choice. Kidding How me. many people have held the weather? Three. Bang! Yes! Oh, yes she yes, always yes, wins! Yes, she does. That's right. Bob Ryan, uh, Bob Ryan from WRC, oh, Willard Scott, who had been at well WRC wow, in Washington, it. and yours truly. There you, you know have what, Al? Three? How, can oh, we just three? pause for a second? How cool for you, too. I know, I know. One of I'm three. So honored. Wow. The other two are just spectacular. Wow. Unique. And I got to, got to work with Bob and, for a number of years. And I've known that. So final score, four. What, for, what's the prize? For the prize is you get to be here for the 100th anniversary. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> You'll be on a smucker's jar. <laughs> if you, 
Okay. All right. Hey, listen. By the way, let me just say, yes. I know that Savannah hosted Jeopardy, but how about yeah. Al Roker? Oh, Roker. Yes. Al, I Al think Roker. that's your next gig. You did no, such no. a good job. Streaming is going to be calling you this afternoon. Wow, this will be a up. show. And you know, we did a game show on MSNBC when it first started called Remember This. It was a news game show. Oh, my and God. Well, you're pitching right you're now. You're about to bring it back. Let's bring it back, baby. After the break, some heartfelt Harry Smith stories that you don't want to miss. Stay with us. back here on The Boost with one of our favorites, Harry Smith. Harry recently traveled to a famed restaurant from the long-running series South Park that's sure to give patrons a taste of the cult comedy in real life. Take a look. It's big and it's pink. And for decades, Casa Bonita was Colorado's go-to pleasure palace for kids. Usually when we came here, it was a birthday. I felt exotic when I came here. It felt like I had gone away. And since those halcyon days, Casa Bonita has occupied an extraordinary amount of space. Wow, Casa Bonita! Woo-hoo! In the What's psyches that? of South Park creators and Colorado natives, Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Ever since we started, the building, we have named our office Casa Bonita. It's like fate. Fate would mean Casa Bonita's closing down and bankruptcy. They had to buy it. And I said, yes. And he goes, I know, but don't get to me. We don't know yet. I'm like, yes. And I was just like, we're doing that, yes. To be kind, Casa Bonita had seen better days. It was a wreck. The idea of these two guys buying it was funny, a kind of extravagant gag, or so we thought. So this is without irony, then? It's not a joke. And that's the thing is it, it, it had become a joke. And we were sad that it had become a joke because you could see what this place was in the 70s when they built it. You know, they were trying to make a little Disneyland here. We're here, Casa Bonita. Oh, man, this is going to be so great. 20 years ago, Parker and Stone immortalized their love for Casa Bonita in a South Park episode. I feel like Cartman a lot here, you know, just going in there, and we could do this, and we could do that, you know, we could do that. It really is. Watching, watching Trey walk around and get, have, and, and, well, the, role, the emotional roller coaster of doing this, you know, he's, yeah. he's feeling it as much as, as Cartman would. You know? <laughs> this is almost like restoring an important national I, landmark. Yes. It's not almost. That, yeah, it, it was. Is. Oh, it is. Yes, it is. And yeah. restoration is a, be, is a better word than renovation. Because right. it would cost way less to just rebuild this. Right. Make a better version of it down the road. It makes me it, wonder what that number is. It's close to infinity yeah <laughs> it approaches infinity we toured the giant restaurant slash joy factory to see what infinity dollars can create a lot of cool stuff like any construction project there was a punch list this one a bit bigger than most you can see there's some stuff they checked off and there's some stuff not checked off and yeah 
It's only a uh, hundred. Don't worry about that. We're good. We're yeah. good. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> the cliff divers were showing off the day we were there. Yes, there are cliff divers. The old 70s look of swimwear back. They made these custom for us. We always believed cliff divers performed to distract us from how bad the food was. To the rescue, a new chef, James Beard nominee, Dana Rodriguez. People mentality is like, we still have the same menu, but now it's true food. Rodriguez possesses a kind of personal superpower reflected in her sopapillas. See? Perfecto. Parker and Stone figure they'll need about six million customers a night to break even. So be reassured, they are not leaving their day jobs. So of my uh, favorite recent episodes was the one about the Canadian royalty. The prince and his wife. <laughs> we want privacy. We want privacy. Yes. Right. Canadian royalty, yes. Canadian royalty. Just because I'm Canadian royalty. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that just broke through. I mean, every English person I know was ca calling me. Like, every single one. You know what I mean? <laughs> and what were they saying to you? I mean, thank honestly, you. they were thank you. They were saying thank you. As much as people think that South Park, we get in a room and go, okay, who can we make angry and who can we piss off? It's not. It's how can we make people laugh? Can you do this forever? You'll find interviews of me <laughs> at, at age 30 saying, well, it's not like I'll be doing South Park when I'm 40 years old. You know, so it's like, it really is like we get back in there and we get just kind of back to our roots. It's actually, I think, honestly, healthy for us now. Stick around, we've got another story that's sure to boost your day after the break. Welcome back to The Boost. We've got one last uplifting story we just had to share with you guys. Check it out. A high school senior named Jamar got a graduation gift that he will never forget. An unexpected guest showed up to watch him get his diploma. Turn to your left. Turn to your left. Turn to your left. That is Jamar's dad. He flew in all the way from Kuwait, where he's stationed, to surprise his son on his big day. And you can see there, Jamar obviously couldn't be happier to see him. Thanks so much for joining us for another day full of feel-good energy. Can't wait to bring you more uplifting stories tomorrow, right here on Today All Day. Welcome to Try This Today. I'm Al Roker, and of course, you know, my fellow Third Hour co-hosts. Well, we're always trying something new, and we wanted to set out just to do that. Chanel taking on a dance aerobics class. Dylan Dreyer making a custom handbag. 
Craig Melvin trying his hand at woodworking, and all four of us checking out a boozy candle making class. But first, I stopped by a local gem in my own neighborhood that's been part of New York City's Upper East Side for almost 100 years. I'm talking the Lexington Candy Shop, where their famous Coke float recently went viral on TikTok. And I got the chance to find out how it's made. You ready for the Coke float? I'm ready. All right, go in there. That's the Coke float, please. Coke floats, Coke floats for everybody, yeah! At nearly a century old, the Lexington Candy Shop has stood at the corner of Lexington and East 83rd Street since 1925. Founded by Soterius Phyllis, a Greek immigrant, his son Pete joined the family business in 1930. Not much has changed over the years, except now people are lining up just to get in. And you'll find John behind the counter, the third generation Phyllis, who now owns the business with his partner, Bob Karcher. Your father was here, your grandfather's here. Did you think you were gonna end up running the place? I started working here when I was 14. Now it's 2023, and I'm still here. I, I like it, you know? I like the food, I like the customers, and the environment. How did it get named the Lexington Candy Shop? Because you, you don't really sell that much candy. No, but when my grandfather started in 1925, they were making candies downstairs. And a lot of the Greeks went into the candy business, and we did too, and that was it. You walk in and there are regulars. I mean, what keeps people coming here to the Lexington candy shop? The ones that come every day, we know them. We don't have Wi-Fi because we want people to talk. These days, both regulars and new customers are talking even more about the iconic luncheonette's Coke floats. I can see what everyone waits for. After popping on social media, this post alone went viral with 45 million views. Wow, beautiful. Within the hours, people were coming here, the next day went viral. And I'm a star. <laughs> we're, we're both stars right here. <laughs> John says that the luncheonette used to sell on average about 50 of these sweet treats a week. How many are you making now? A week? Probably about a thousand. Wow. I live in the neighborhood and I'm I'm walking around. Well, I see these lines. What has that been like for you guys? Besides the fact it's, it's stunning, <laughs> it's very tiring, but we like it. For two years with COVID, we were trying to get through it. Now we got it, we're here, and we're making up for it, so to speak. We used to get one shipment of ice cream a week. Now we're getting three or four. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit, I don't think I've ever had a Coke float. Can you show me how you make a Coke float? That's what you're gonna do. We're doing it together. We're ready to go. Time to head straight to the pint for the scoop. Oh, this is the way that we were doing it 100 years ago. Wow. All right, I think I remember that. First, John giving yes. me a quick tutorial. Three, three four, 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 five, five six. six. And you're stirring while you do it. Vanilla. Of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, nice little plop. Now it's my turn. Glass. I pump the Coca-Cola syrup into a glass. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then add seltzer and stir. Oh, he's good. Look at this. Next, ice cream. Mm -hmm. Finally, I top it off with a spritz of seltzer. <laughs> That's living. Now to a place where candy and history meet, the oldest continually running candy shop in Philadelphia. I got the chance to go behind the scenes and learn another skill, how to make a chocolate bar. For over 150 years, Shane Confectionery, the country's oldest continuously operating candy store, has stood here. Established in 1863, the shop was just one of many candy businesses in Philadelphia, but none standing the test of time quite like Shane's. Has it always had the name Shane's out front? No, it was owned by Daniel S. Dangler and W.T. Westcott, both uh, confectioners in the trade. And then by 1911, Edward Shane took over and his family owned it for 99 years. Wow. So. In 2010, the Shane family sold the sweet spot to brothers Ryan and Eric Burley. 
Because this is kind of a turn of the century candy shop, do you always dress the parts? Wearing the bow ties also doesn't get caught in the machinery. Preserving Shane's became a labor of love for the brothers, restoring everything from the floors to the decades old candy making equipment. It was really a jewel that needed to be polished. And we were just astounded by the beauty of the place and the fact that they were still making chocolates here. Why was it important to keep the name Shane? They had been here for nearly 100 years. It didn't feel natural for us to impose our own name or some other name. How much responsibility do you feel in carrying on the tradition of this really historical name here in, in Philadelphia? I think part of uh, the, the history and calling uh, for carrying out confectionery is having roots in integrity of how they used to do it. Those candy-making traditions alive and well upstairs above the shop, where Shane's chocolates are handcrafted from bean to bar by a team led by head chocolate maker Kevin Pascal. Do you dream about different kinds of chocolate bars, like thinking about what's the next chocolate bar? And we get inspiration all the time from all kinds of different things. You kind of think about how you can translate these things into like a confectionery experience. So you're gonna show me how to make a bar? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Get your mold ready, okay. press the pedal, slide the mold all the way to the back, okay. let the chocolate deposit. After a few tries. This is what our finished bar looks like here. And this bar is etched in the exact same way that that chocolate maker used to make chocolate here on this block, Benjamin Jackson. And then this is the back, topped with our sea salt and our peppercorn. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's very unique. Today, the shop, still an homage to the past by making clear toy candy, a rare seasonal sugary treat dating back to the 1800s. Mark, I've, I've never heard of of clear toys when it comes to candy. What is that? It's a Pennsylvania German tradition. It's uh -huh. candy statues at the end of the day. We have 1,200 molds, and they're all very, very old Victorian designs. So how do you do this? Because uh, it, it's, it's like molten sugar. So what could possibly go wrong? A lot. <laughs> In fact, weather is a huge factor when making clear toys. It needs to be cold, and it needs to be dry. If it's really anything else, you get sticky product, you get cloudy product. All right, and now we wait. After about 30 minutes, time to pour some sugar. You're doing great, you're natural. But I learned quickly, this is not so easy. It's delicate sugar, it'll break in your hand. Then we crack open the molds and see my clear toy creations. I'd like to give you a hand. Maybe we'll call this one Owl Roker. Ah, well, when they made me, they broke the mold. My work here is done. Oh, that was a tasty trip. Well, coming up, Chanel meets the force of nature behind a step aerobics class that's taking Atlanta by storm. And later, Craig's first attempt at woodworking. Did that go wrong? We'll find out. Welcome back to Try This Today. Our third hour co-host, Chanel Jones, as you know, is known for her dance moves. For her Try It Challenge, she decided to take a hip-hop aerobics class that put even her dance skills to the test. 
one night, I'm scrolling through Instagram as I do before I go to bed, and I stumble across this step class. And I'm like, oh, I wanna find this guy. And here I am. Just one video, and I was hooked. That is EJ Houston, and every Thursday night, he turns his gym into a step aerobics dance floor. Tell me about Get Down, Stay Down. Where did this come from? The motto is you get the weight off and you keep it off with like extreme movement, having fun. I flew down to Atlanta to see it for myself, and in the process, learned that EJ has a powerful story fueling his upbeat workouts, having tragically lost his mom when he was just eight years old. When I tell somebody that, they instantly pay attention because they're going through things at home, they're going through things with their parents, going through things at work, and it's like, okay, how is this person that has all of the same stuff going on keeps leveling up? by refusing to stay down and sad. Instead, EJ focused his energy into his dreams as an athlete and ultimately a personal trainer. Your passion, your energy just, it comes across. I just met you and I feel it. My purpose is to just help people. Wanting to help more than just one person at a time, EJ made a commitment to motivate others who may be going through struggles of their own. He started teaching group step classes and knew there was only one way to get people in the door, by throwing a party. So if somebody walks into your class, what will they see? Fun, people releasing, people that may be going through pain and they're at least having a good time for that one hour. Those people make up the hundreds of folks who show up both in person and online week after week. So this series is called Try This Today. Mm -hmm. Why should someone give Step a chance? It's just a fun way to just move, and that's all that Step Aerobics is about. You can do it fancy, but if you get on it, you can just get on and off and on and off to the beat. It's actually fun. It looked fun, and I was there to learn from the man himself. But my morning TV job kept me from staying to take his nighttime class. So EJ brought together a group of his best steppers to help show me the moves. So tell me, what do you say to motivate everybody? One band, one sound. What do you mean by that? One person messed up his routine, we gotta start it over. Is he tough love? Yeah. I'm tough on everybody. He doesn't come up and give you a little hug? Oh, no. No. <laughs> All right, I'm ready to learn. All right. Okay. So the first move, okay? Okay. We're gonna say, one, two, three, four, boom, knee. One, two, three, four, boom, knee. Right. <laughs> Second move, we're starting to the left side again. Take, Take it, it back. back. Boom, knee, knee kick, kick, knee. knee. Yeah. Now the other side. Wait, that's the most encouraging, like, whatever. Knee, kick, kick knee. knee. That's it. Clap it up. The third and final move. Step, step over, over, step back, step over, boom, knee. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look, one okay. band. One sound. Yep. Guess who's in the band? <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> Finally, it was time to put it all to music. Okay. You ready? Let's go. Knee, kick, step, step, over, step, back, step, over. No surprise, Chanel was incredible. Well, now it's Dylan Dreyer's turn, learning how to make her very own bag in one afternoon, and it might inspire you to get crafting as well. As the saying goes, behind every woman is a fabulous purse. And although we all have our own baggage. That is in Dylan Dreyer's wow. bag? Thanks. Oh. I just had to try my hand at making handbags. This is Anthony Luciano's studio, right here in Manhattan's Garment District. Anthony has been a leather craftsman and admired accessory designer for nearly 25 years. What is it about handbags that you like? I say handbags are a piece of art with a handle. Who have we seen carrying your bags? Meryl Streep has carried something at the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Judith Light is a really great client. Today, he's putting me to work for one of his sip and stitch classes. So what kind of accessories will people make at a sip and stitch class? Usually we make a really simple little card case. Then we do a little simple 
crossbody wallet. But for today, we're gonna do something special. We're gonna do this larger bag. Oh, nice. Yep. I need a new bag. Everybody needs a new bag. <laughs> cheers to a sip, and then you'll teach me how to stitch? Yes, cheers okay. to yeah. I love, I love it. it. First, we picked out fabrics. So you're gonna need to figure out what you'd like for the outside first. Okay. This I is just like intriguing. And my grandmother is... was obsessed with roosters. Or do I go with something more practical, more every day? That yeah. matches all my outfits, but that's not fun. Okay, but right, that's a little boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna steer you away from boring. Let's go wild, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. What kind of material do you look for for the inside of a bag for longevity? I usually use suede. It does wear really well. So these are the colors you want. A pop of color. Yeah, I think so. Beautiful wine color. This looks nice. It right. changes the whole it vibe. It changes the whole vibe. This is nice, nice too, because it does pick up some of the greens mm -hmm. here. I think I, I kind of like this wine color. I like that too. Yeah. Next, we cut each fabric into a standard purse shape. Fortunately, Anthony has a stencil for that. Very nicely done with your finger placement along oh, the edge. Oh, thank you. I feel like I'm with my son, like, stay in the lines. No. <laughs> Yay, ta -da. Then we glue the inner suede to a filler layer that will give the purse shape and add the exterior leather on top of that. But you want to be even, so not too so much, not, lumpy. not too much, and not too little okay. because you want you don't want any bubbles. Mm -hmm. Take a tool like this. Mm. Just so you that on my face in the morning. Right? It's great. I don't know what it does, but I like it. It feels good. <laughs> it feels good. When everything dries, we punch holes where the grommets and buttons will eventually go. Oh, that's easier than it. Yeah. Squeeze it in there if you can. Cool. And we edge paint so my project wouldn't fall apart at the seams. I'm pretty hot in here, so I'm gonna cool myself down. Soon, it was assembly time. So we're gonna fold these, line up all the holes. And then it just goes together just like that? No way. There you go. There you go. And then and just screw this thing up. Oh my in. gosh, yes. We added straps for a crossbody look, and I have to say, I nailed it. <laughs> and voila, my very own one of a kind original. Look at my bag. Oh my God, look how cute that oh my is. Oh gosh, it is so adorable. <laughs> I love it so much. I also want to give you a little cherry on the cake. Ooh. And feel like no one should leave here without a tassel. This bag just keeps getting better, better and better. And better. Dylan, that's your bag, baby. Up next, Craig's first attempt at woodworking. And just wait till you see the finished product. Plus, all four of us get lit with a boozy candle making class. Don't go away.
We are back with Try This Today. Interestingly enough, Craig's always wanted to try woodworking, so he called on an expert to help him nail it. In my line of work, it's easy to get caught up in the news cycle. Hurricane disaster zone in Florida yesterday. You've got to stay plugged in to keep up to date on ever-changing events. Making time for myself can be a bit of a challenge. I do not have a lot of time uh, because of the job. I have two small children. I'd like to think I am committed to growth. I need to acquire new skills. So I decided to try woodworking. Anytime I see like something that's, that's well made out of wood, I always think, wow, it'd be cool to try to make something like that. But I needed some help. Meet Kenan Spiegel, the son of a carpenter. He grew up with hands-on knowledge on how to use tools. I spent most of my childhood around job sites, helping frame houses, um, taking home the scraps and kind of building stuff. He's got a job in finance, but his passion project is a company he started called Westport Woodworks. His garage workshop is his refuge. It's where he built elaborate play sets, like this pirate ship for his young sons. He's also volunteered his talents, constructing personalized play sets for sick children through the Make-A-Wish Foundation. In 2020, he got the idea for his next project. So I was driving with my son, my oldest son, and I was thinking, how cool would it be to build an Adirondack chair for a smaller child? It seemed like the perfect project for me to start on. First, we use the jigsaw to shape the arms of the chair. You're gonna place the board on here, uh -huh. holding it tight, keeping your hands away from the blade. Keenan demonstrates, then it's my turn. Have to clean that one up a little bit. <laughs> clean that one up just a smidge. Just a smidge. Next, we use something called a router to smooth the edges. See that? Now we have a nice rounded edge. Oh, wow. Edge. And this one, you can feel the difference. Yeah. So it gives it that nice rounded edge, no sharp corners. My turn. Wow. Much smoother. It's much smoother. To speed things up, Keenan has pre-cut all the pieces we need to assemble the chair. So the, the entire chair is in front of us? Correct. Okay. Our first step is going to be driving some screws in here. And what we're going to do is we're going to attach this piece right like so, just like that. Just like that? Yep. This is, a, this is cathartic. Oh, it is. This is cathartic. We talk as we work about our lives and our families. The minutes slip by, and you can start to see the chair take shape. All right, here it here is. Here we go. Here we go. Yes. There you go. I am now a woodworker. Great not, job. Not really. Great I know. Job. But th th here's the thing. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. And it's also really cool to be able to look and see something that you've created. Yeah, you know this. Working with my hands, learning something new, taking the time for myself. I help build a chair and so much more. I want my kids to be able to like see dad make something. Dad did that. How cool would that be? Try This Today continues after.
We're so glad you stuck around. Chanel, Dylan, Craig, and I recently went to a boozy candle making class, and we'll say it sparked a lot of laughs. It'll all make sense when you see this. Most people use candles to wind down, but for us, it was a good excuse to get out of Studio 1A and get lit. Are you guys ready to re-wax and unwind? Actually, Craig waxed just before we got here. <laughs> I love it. Don't encourage that. My name is Ashley. I am the founder and franchisor of Rewax and Unwind. I understand the wax part, the candle. What's the unwind part? Oh, we're going to be drinking. Oh. oh, wow. Our first stop, the fragrance station to test our senses. So, Craig, what do you think this one is? It smelled uh, akin to vanilla, but it's not. I actually took this from the Spirits and Cocktails. Ooh. And Perfect. Yes. Oh, yeah. Great job, Al. <laughs> so this one is under the clean category, OK? OK. What is? I know it. It's on the tip of my tongue now, too. Dryer <laughs> sheet. Yeah, it's like. I'm thinking like baby wipes. Baby powder. Oh, oh yes. Yes. very good. Yeah. Ashley directing us to sniff away and write down our favorite aromas. Oh, I hate hazelnut. <laughs> Ooh, this is nice. Smell this, moonflower. I like that. You know what? I'm surprised that I picked Axe body spray. <laughs> oh my god, that was so bad. Almost bubble gummy. Okay. Honeysuckle? Moonflower. Yeah. Smells like um, deodorant. As Ashley got our next station ready, we uncorked and unwind. Toast. To the nonsense people. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, what, what, look at you. you to the nonsense people. Yeah, sense. Like sense? Yes. Very smart. Cheers. Wow, that was very nice. After we settled on our four fragrances, it was time to combine them at the candle making station. Creating oh, oh. our signature scents. I've got the Sequoia English Oak, Bourbon, I've got Moonflower, and Old Library Books. Oh, you like smoky, dusty. I do. Kind of like me. Uh, uh, old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I've got Fraser Fur. Okay, very Christmassy. I've got Jasmine, Clean Linen, and Axe Body Spray. <laughs> Would you yeah. pick Dylan? Clean Linen, Sea Breeze, Vanilla, and Cucumber. Oh, I think I had Citra, oh, uh, Citra, Fraser Fur. Old library, grapefruit. So we're going to determine how we're going to find our signature scent. The lids are already open for you. All you're going to do is say, does zucchini blossom go well with sandalwood rose, as an example? And you're going to move oh. your head back and forth. Oh. You puff. Yes. There you go. Mm. So the beakers, this is where the magic happens. You're literally going to go drop by drop until you get to 20 milliliters, OK? So you're going to say a little bit of zucchini blossom, a little bit of cinnamon. Okay. And you're going to use your stirring utensil here, stir, and let your nose lead you to what you want to add next. Oh. I was trying to be polite, but Dylan smells like Robitussin. <laughs> I think so? Maybe it needs more vanilla. <laughs> That's not that bad. That smells like you have the flu. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I love it. You like that? Very mass plant, but sweet. Kind of like, like yourself. Ah, yeah, that's good. That's sweet. I like I it a lot. I differ on that one. OK, here we go. Now that's Just, just kind that's of a nice, fresh. clean citron gourmet. Like Wait, I want to out. Next, we poured hot wax into our mixtures along with colored dyes and some special adornments. Once our candle creations dried, it was the moment of truth. So here are your candles, guys. What do you think? Listen, I <laughs> buy owls. Yes. I love mine. Like, I, I, this is really, really awesome. It's rare that I say this, but I choose Craig's. Oh, I think you make a whip. Oh, I love the glitter on top. All in all, I think you'd agree. It was a sensational day to buddy up. Oh, cheers. Here's to these fantastic cheers. scents. Each one different and each one special. Aww. Just like all of you. Aww. Oh, wow, that was so sweet. I can't wait to give this to someone as a Christmas gift. <laughs> oh, very nice. By the way, Rewax and Unwind is franchising, so keep an eye out for one in your neck of the woods. We had a lot of fun trying these new activities, and we hope you'll get creative and try something new. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Al Roker. See you next time on Today All Day. The rush of the water, the thrill of the catch. For many, fishing isn't just a hobby or a career, it's a lifestyle. In the U.S., women account for roughly 10% of commercial fishermen, but they've long played a vital role in the global seafood industry. 
I'm Elena Besser. As a chef, recipe developer, and content creator, I'm always hungry to learn more about the people who keep our food systems running. So I'm heading out to meet two women making waves in the fishing world and creating more space for everyone at the table. Welcome to the lush forests, expansive beaches, and pristine rivers of Washington State's Olympic Peninsula. Pacific Coast Indigenous peoples have called these bountiful lands their home for millennia. The Quinault Indian Nation is one of many tribes that fishes, hunts, and forages here. As a non-native, I'm fortunate to be invited to the Quinault Reservation by fishing guide and tribal member, Ashley Lewis. When I think about the rivers, the oceans, the lakes out here. What I think about is home. Ashley comes from a long line of Native Americans who fished these waters for years. In the 1850s, many tribes were forced to give up their land for white settlements, but they retained fishing and hunting rights on traditional lands. During the 1960s, as Washington State began infringing on those rights, Native Americans staged a series of protests known as fish-ins. These protests led to a landmark Supreme Court decision that protects Native fishing rights to this day. One activist at the forefront of that movement was Janet McLeod, dubbed the Rosa Parks of the American Indian Movement. Her advocacy has inspired generations of Indigenous trailblazers, including my guide. When they were forced to cede their land for newcomers, their waterscapes, the rivers, the lakes. It makes so much sense that that was the thing that's like, no, we have to have this because it's so essential to who we are. Quinault tribal members have exclusive hunting and fishing rights on a portion of this river. I couldn't wait to see Ashley's favorite fishing spots with the help of fellow guides Ruben Estevio and John Tater Bryson. If you want to think like a fish, just think like a really lazy person. Great. Like, what is going to be the easiest thing to do? Uh huh. Is it, do you want to go up that fast water? Not really. You right. want to kind of be in like the slow, easy water. Time for a quick casting lesson. We're just going to swing straight back and then we're going to swing straight forward. You can kind of feel when the current catches it. Okay. Go ahead and give it a shot. That was a good cast. Thank that was you. a great cast. That's high praise coming from Ashley, who's been a guide here for the past decade. Now she's become something of a celebrity among outdoor enthusiasts, amassing a large following on social media where she goes by the handle Bad Ash. Her YouTube and Instagram pages are chock full of how-to videos and inspiring content from her many outdoor adventures. Can you explain to me some of the, you know, stereotypical experiences that you have had that have been a little bit tough as a female fisherman in this community? Being a woman in a male-dominated sport poses challenges. Some people want me to stay in a lane that isn't my lane. I would like to see the outdoor industry be more welcoming to women. I would like to see it be more welcoming to women of color and people of color. I feel really proud to get to chip away at that on my own terms. There we go. Reconnecting with the Quinault and their fishing traditions has been a journey for Ashley. She grew up removed from her tribe, living an hour off the reservation with her mom and two siblings. I grew up in a really small community, moved to a smaller community, one stop light in town sort of deal. And you had two options. You um, get in trouble or you go fishing. Okay. And I picked fishing. <laughs> I love it. And why did your mom choose to raise you off of the reservation? She experienced a lot of adversity as a younger woman and as a Native American woman. And so some of that adversity caused her to be really protective of her kids. And she wanted us to love our culture. The Quinault are a matriarchal society. Women serve as the head of the household and often take on tribal leadership roles. The women here also help with traditional food gathering. Ashley grew up fishing with her mom, but didn't always appreciate the cultural meaning behind these trips. Tell me a little bit about how you met your tribal family. So about the time that I got a driver's license and I could take myself fishing, <laughs> things really changed for me. <laughs> and so I would kind of drive out to the reservation, explore a little bit, being out there among other Quinaults, fishing for salmon, that's everything that I needed. Yeah. And so that moment was profound to me. John Tater Bryson, one of the first professional guides she met on the reservation, soon became her mentor. I was taught from a young age how to harvest 
elk and deer and fish. And it's passed on to the younger people, so the tradition will keep going. I think I got something. Oh, you definitely do. What a cutie. Oh, hey, my guy. Bye. Ashley enjoys showcasing this beautiful place to new people, but she's also made it her mission to call out the effects of climate change to this land. What we're seeing here, this is a big slide, and we're seeing a lot of this along our river, and this is the effects of climate change. She's currently earning a PhD in Indigenous Studies, with plans to educate people about the tribes of the PNW and the environmental threats they face. With the weather warming, with different rain patterns, it changes the river, but it also changes where fish are going to be spending time. Fishing guides are like an indicator species because we're the ones out in the river day in and day out. We're the ones who see changes happening really quickly. Because of the climate threats to the Quinault, the Biden administration granted the tribe $25 million to help relocate members in flood-prone areas. This is, you know, ancient village sites. This is burial ground sites. And so to see those places washed away, this is a really significant blow to us. Indigenous people are generally the first impacted by climate change, especially if you're situated right on the Pacific Ocean. Sustainability practices are tenets for the Quinault. Three tribal-run fish hatcheries help maintain the populations of salmon and trout species that call this river home. Every spring, millions of salmon and steelhead are released from these hatcheries. So we were a few miles upriver fishing, mm -hmm. but now we're here at the mouth. The Pacific Ocean is right on the other side of our fish house here, and this is where tribal members come and set their nets and commercially fish for blueback sockeye. It's the only place in the world where our blueback sockeye run, so okay, it's an right. incredibly special fish to us. Commercial salmon fishing is a big part of the economy on the res. The most efficient way to get a big catch is by using a method called gill netting. Gill nets are placed near the mouth of the river to catch salmon by the gills as they head upstream. Whoa, double trouble. That's a huge one. As a chef, I've cooked fish many different ways, but this was the freshest catch I've ever tried. Cooking salmon the way her tribe has for generations is a cherished pastime for Ashley, who celebrates her culture through food. The fish is a really wonderful, tasty, oily fish, mm -hmm. and we just want to highlight the greatness that already lives here. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. The flavor that we're gonna give it really is gonna come from the alder fire and the cedar sticks. After the fish is on the pole, it's supported with cedar sticks woven across the filet. The salmon cooks until it turns light pink, another five minutes, then it's ready to serve. So now we can enjoy ourselves some Quinault fish sticks. Let's do it. Oh my gosh. Hmm. I'm never ever gonna look at a normal fish stick ever again in the same way. <laughs> comes right off of that skin. It really doesn't need anything else. Let the food shine. Absolutely. Yeah.
after an incredible day of catching and cooking fish on the Quinault River, it was time for a trip to the beach. At sunrise, my guide Ashley Lewis and tribal biologist Scott Mazzoni are ready to show me another local pastime, digging for razor clams. Can you tell me a little bit more about what we're doing today? We are getting ready to have uh, uh, home use digs, subsistence digs, and commercial digs of razor clams. And before we do that, we got to go out and get clam samples and test them to make sure there's no toxins in them and they're self, uh, safe for people to eat. Pacific razor clams are a meaty shellfish with an oblong shell. They can grow up to six inches. They're also a delicacy here and a major part of the quinault diet. So we're gonna use these spade tempered shovels. They're kind of curved in a way that makes it easy for us to dig the clams. Great. So we're gonna head out to the surf. We're gonna look for clam shows. As we walk towards the surf, Ashley points out small holes and dimples in the sand. These are known as clam shows, evidence that razor clams are just beneath the surface. That looks like a good spot. Whoa! There we are. Down here they have their foot and that they can use to dig very quickly down into the sand. Hey. He's like, I'm out of here. Thank you and goodbye. Ooh. I gotta tell you, even though it's 5 a.m., all of this razor clam digging is making me extremely hungry and ready to eat them. And they are as delicious as they are fun to dig. <laughs> It was finally time for me to see what all the fuss is really about. At nearby Ocean Crest restaurant, razor clams are a menu staple. Head chef Amanda Yeager has prepared a few of their signature dishes made with fresh local clams. On the menu, a panko crusted razor clam steak served with pickled onions and a chili aioli. There's also a razor clam omelet plus a flatbread topped with Amanda's house-made razor clam sausage. Mmm. There's a common misconception with large clams, you know, oh, would it taste rubbery, but this does not at all. That's a lot of how it's treated. It's, you know, low and slow heat, and that's why they maintain their flavor and their texture. Respect. Wow. So much. Everyone knows and loves a chicken cutlet. This is so tender on the inside. You're getting an amazing, crisp exterior. That crunch and acidity coming from the onion, it is the perfect bite. As my time on the Quinault land comes to a close, I'm already sad to leave this incredible place. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you could say one thing to the people that are watching this, what, what would you want them to know? about you and about this community. My very favorite piece about guiding is not actually the fishing. It is the way that it changes the way people start seeing the natural world. It could tell a lot about history. It could give you a lot of information. But I do know from my experience that when people are there and experience it, they're going to become curious, and that's what I want the most.
When it comes to high-end seafood, lobster is pretty much king. Maine is the largest lobster producer in the country, with catchers here harvesting over 100 million pounds of the crustacean every year. I've just always admired the fishermen, and to even be able to say that I'm a fisherman just means so much to me. Sadie Samuels is the only female commercial lobster boat captain in the small town of Rockport. Her day starts before sunrise when she buys bait for her traps. Hi. Hey, Sadie. Welcome. Oh, it's so great to find you. Look at this stunning place of work. Are you kidding? With its rocky underwater terrain and cool waters year round, the Gulf of Maine is a perfect home for lobsters. Hi, guys. The lobster industry here generates over $1 billion for the state. But those big bucks aren't made easily. Fishing for lobsters is one of the most dangerous professions. The fatality rate is 2.5 times the national average. Can you tell me a little bit more about how dangerous this job actually is? It's one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. The first funeral I ever went to was one of the fishermen in my harbor who went out by himself and he got rope, like, die on, so he on drowned. lobster. Yes, he drowned. Why do you stay in this despite all of the pain and dangers that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis? I literally never imagined doing anything else with my entire life. Sadie's passion for fishing stems from her childhood. Her father, Matt Samuels, has been catching lobsters for over 60 years. He was up before sunrise and out the door, and then he'd get home and he'd just work until dark and come in and eat dinner and pass out. So the only way I could really hang out with him was if I wanted to like get involved with what he was doing. And then I just stuck around and I never left. <laughs> When she was just seven, Sadie got her student lobster license. She began working right away, dropping a couple traps off her dad's boat for extra cash. By age 14, she saved enough money to buy the boat she still fishes with today. I don't think I fully considered that it was like my career or gonna be my career until a little bit later in life, until I was like 14, 15. I love how you said later in life when I was about 14. I just, <laughs> I just started getting serious about it. You were 14. That is hilarious and amazing. After studying art in college, Sadie quickly returned to a life at sea. Like when I'm out here, I'm just like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Today, Sadie doesn't just catch lobsters, she also dishes up fresh lobster rolls at her seat table restaurant, also named Must Be Nice. I would like you to walk me through your day from start to finish, so lay it on me. <laughs> so my average day is waking up around four o'clock, quarter to four, go to the boat, and then we haul about 250 traps, crate up the lobsters that we're bringing over to the restaurant, and then the restaurant closes at seven. In Maine, just 15% of lobster licenses are held by women. But anyone who catches lobsters is called a lobsterman, which Sadie stands behind. How do you feel about the term lobsterman? I'm very much on the side of like, I'm a fisherman, I'm a lobsterman. I've busted my butt and paid my dues. Nothing I do really has to do with my gender. Maine fishing laws have strict limits on the number of traps new lobstermen can set. Over time, they can acquire more traps, but it can take several years to make a livable wage. How did you get savvy with making sure that you could function as a successful business? That's actually how I started Must Be Nice Lobster, is on Saturdays, someone was looking for someone to sell lobsters at a farmer's market. I started selling live lobsters there and then now we're here. The trap limits are part of Maine's successful conservation efforts. In the 90s, there were around 37 million pounds of lobster in the Gulf of Maine. Today, it's nearly 120 million pounds. Fishermen actually were the ones who started to put a lot of those practices in place. Those regulations impose strict sizing guidelines. Sadie actually throws back many of the lobsters she catches. That one will be good next year. Small lobsters are too young for sale, while many older, large lobsters get thrown back to breed. So this is a, a big hard shell female. You can see on her, if you turned her the other way, She's it's the second to right swimmerette has this mutilation on it. Got it. Which means that 
someone else has caught her before with eggs on it. A keeper lobster has a body that measures between three to five inches. It can take a lobster about seven years to reach that size. Finally, a lobster that was just right. Look at those claws. Nice male, really gorgeous lobster. He's definitely a keeper. Yeah, you're coming home with us, babe. Climate change is making these size regulations more crucial than ever. The Gulf of Maine is one of the Earth's fastest warming bodies of water, which can make lobsters more vulnerable to disease and less likely to reproduce. Why is sustainability so important to you? We're so connected with nature and so connected with our environment that it like feels like our duty. At Sadie's restaurant, she's dedicated to sourcing her ingredients sustainably. The lobster chowder uses a seafood stock made from an invasive crab species. And she's adding a new locally raised item to the menu. This season we're adding in oysters and I'm super excited because we're trying to focus as much as we can on female owned farms and also the quality of the seafood is like outstanding. To get a sneak peek at her new menu offering, Sadie took me to meet farm manager Bonita Johnson at Wright Cove Oyster Farm. So tell me a little bit more about these oysters. We're a small operation here, and so we do kind of everything by hand. Wow. And uh, yeah, they're raised with love. You and, can taste it. And yeah, <laughs> you really can. Do you want to try one real quick? Um, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Sorry, I've been waiting over here. <laughs> Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. Wow. These are hands down some of my favorite oysters mm. ever. So <laughs> clean, but briny. I've never had anything like this before. I'm blown away. You don't do anything in the working waterfront type of industry unless you have passion for it. Mm -hmm. And that's a really nice thing for us to like get to share with each other. Yeah. This is definitely my happy place. Back at Must Be Nice, Sadie is steaming our catch before picking meat for her signature lobster rolls. Hey, fresh caught, fresh cooked. I just had to know the secrets behind the Sadie sauce lobster roll. So how did you come up with the sauce? So I've had plenty of people, you know, from away say that Maine's lobster rolls are really boring. And I kind of took offense to that. I was yeah. like, you know what? I gotta come up with something that like packs a punch, has a bit of a spice. It starts with shallots, celery, and parsley blended in a food processor. Sadie then adds a not so secret blend of dried herbs and spices. Can you reveal what's it's in this spice It's mainly blend? paprika. The spicy part is cayenne. A mix of lemon juice and rice wine vinegar kick up the acid. And then there's a generous squeeze of stone ground mustard. Now we just add in the rest of this olive oil and then I'm gonna blend it for a little while until that just seems totally incorporated. There we go. 
Ooh, that is gorgeous. And that is the Sadie sauce. Sadie packs each toasted bun with a hefty handful of lobster meat. Look at this. Are you kidding me? To finish, a sprinkling of homegrown chives. I can't wait to try that. I'm so pumped. Inspired by Sadie's creativity, I wanted to make something special, a lobster BLT. One of my favorite foods in the summertime is a BLT. And mm -hmm. it really screams summer. And also what screams summer is a juicy lobster roll. So I figured they would pair beautifully together. We're starting with cherry tomatoes. And the reason why I sliced the tomatoes first is because I like to hit them with a little bit of salt. Yes, I brought oh, yeah. a little flaky salt. And what this is gonna do is it's really just gonna pull out all those flavors and make them taste as juicy and delicious as possible. This is my best pal, Mayo. I spice up my mayo with grated garlic, the juice and zest of a lemon, black pepper, and chives. It's such an honor to like cook with the lobster that you have caught. So I just, <laughs> first of all, want to say thank you because this is like the coolest. You are more than welcome. It is my joy. This is a meat lover's dream. So we're going to add two pieces of bacon Ooh. on either side. We're then going to take a gorgeous lettuce leaf. And that's like the boat that's gonna catch all that sauce for us. Just add the lobster, cherry tomatoes, and a final sprinkle of chives. Voila. Well, that is gorgeous. And there you go, BLT lobster roll. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh, this might fall Cheers. over Cheers, if it does, it's part of the fun. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> Holy moly. Oh man. This is insane. This Sadie sauce is slamming. Hubba hubba. I'm honestly having a hard time hearing what you're saying because <laughs> I'm having a moment with this one over here. Oh my God. This is literally perfect. Yay. At dinner, I couldn't wait to learn more from the women here who support each other through their passion for fresh local seafood. When people see that this is a sea to table restaurant and then they find out that you ladies were the ones that actually caught and grew the food that is being served here. What do they say to you? I feel like people, they're super excited about it and really happy that they found us. Then they can taste it with the quality of our seafood or they're in complete disbelief in like, okay, yeah, but your dad caught these. So they're literally saying to you, <laughs> No, this is a man's job. Well, I think some people have been a little too sheltered and just haven't gotten to see what us women can do. <laughs> Amen. And it's up to that. us to show them. Honestly, that's Cheers. another opportunity to toast. I love it. Time to dig in. Mm. I'm really into this BLT one. This is going on the menu, by the way. <laughs> Elena's roll. We're gonna call it Elena's roll. Yeah. Ladies, this is a dinner I will never forget, so I truly can't thank you enough for all of your hard work in making this happen, and thanks for hanging out with me. From the smoky salmon of the Quinault Nation to the buttery, sweet lobster of Maine, I'm in awe of our nation's most delicious seafood. But I'm most inspired by the women paving their own paths in this industry and ensuring future generations will have plenty of fish in the sea. Hi there, guys. Welcome to The Boost. Today, we're going to take a look at the power of sisterhood with organizations doing the important work of bringing connection and confidence to women and girls all across the country. We're gonna start though with a Detroit couple getting their hands dirty to breathe new life into their community. Jacob Sobroff has their story. On any given day, you can hear the buzz of woodwork. So this is the wood shop where all the magic happens. Art created from salvaged material found in wrecked Detroit buildings at this 24,000 square foot warehouse, once an old car dealership. So in here is the place to paint all the cars. Now a showroom and wood shop owned by Bo Shepard and her partner in life and business, Kyle Dubay. 
These are our Ella tables. It's made out of salvage barn flooring um, from like local Metro Detroit barns that have fallen. Well, this is like the first coat. The two are excited about their next big project nearby, which they call the Chateau Beaufay. Beaufay from the name of the street it sits on. This is the future home sweet home, huh? That's it. Yeah, yeah, this is the dream home. Chateau for what they see beyond the boarded up windows and falling sure. bricks. Structurally a little compromised, um, but if you look past that, it's beautiful. Bo Shepard and Kyle Dubay are the owners of Woodward Throwbacks, a passion turned business built on salvaged materials from the streets of Detroit. The two met each other 10 years ago at an abandoned park cleanup, both on bikes. Where did the passion for restoration come from? That kind of is something that happened organically for myself and I think Bo as well. Me and Kyle loved biking and exploring the city. And back then we noticed that there was just so much discarded material, construction debris, um, just vintage antiques. And so we we're like, hey, like we should build something for ourselves using materials. When they started, the Motor City was going through hard times. After declaring bankruptcy in 2013, over 80,000 homes were abandoned. What other people might call trash, you look at it and think what? Possibilities. Possibilities. <laughs> yeah, or it's like, yeah, something that we can completely transform. Kyle's an artist who took woodshop in school. Bo, a designer, who went to school in Detroit for car interior design and worked with her father, a building contractor. They started out selling pieces they made at fairs. Then the big box stores came knocking at their door. When did this go from a passion to a business? Um, probably like within like the year of starting. What we were doing a lot then is little home decor, like wall signs and bottle openers. And we started going to the local farmer's market and we did really well and kept just kind of like, hey, like there might be something here. There's plenty of resources mm -hmm. for materials. There was a lot of texture and honest wear in what we were making. Um, and we've always told the Detroit story. They showed me some of their reclaimed finds. Even this is reclaimed? Yeah. So this is salvaged chalkboard that we got out of a DPS high school. This came from a Detroit public school. Yeah. Yes. So this literally would have been in a, in a landfill Dumps. had you guys not grabbed it. Yeah. Yeah. With bigger goals in mind, they bought this Detroit house for $6,500. Yep, $6,500. It was an eyesore in the neighborhood, and yeah. we're just like, well, we never fully deconstructed an entire house, like saving all the materials. After rehabbing it themselves, they sold it for $410,000. It really is a transformation, huh? Yeah, it's kind of hard to remember what it looked like when we bought it. Yes, the when transformation is... It's pretty great. But in a city where gentrification and flipping can be dirty words. What you do is anything but flipping. And we're doing like the complete opposite. It <laughs> took us like three years and we spent like three times our budget on it. It's like, we're buying this house, one save it, restore it. And we also wanted to show people like, this is how you can renovate a house in the city and still give it so much character, so much soul. This next story gives us a glimpse into the possible future of construction, a whole new kind of home printer that could change the way we build our communities. Take a look. You are witnessing what may be the most significant change in home construction. That is a giant 3D printer, and it's spitting out the walls of a brand new house. Just two men, one with a tablet building, or shall we say, printing a house versus traditional building methods, which would typically require a dozen set of hands. This is the way of the future. This will become mainstream. This will become widespread. And duck, duck, seriously. <laughs> there you go, no duck. The printer's nozzle layers the walls with a concrete type mixture, computer guided construction, which is more precise than a pastry chef's skilled hands decorating a cupcake. It feels a little bit like Play-Doh. How quickly does it harden here? Quickly enough to stack on top of it, right? It's got to stay flowable enough to get to the printer, but then it's got to harden up enough for us to stack on top of it. And that's the secret sauce. Perhaps most significantly, what would typically take a construction crew 10 months to build is now accomplished without wood or nails in about half the time. This may sound like a novel experiment, but it is so much more than that. Here in the Texas Hill Country, in this thousand acre subdivision, they're building a hundred homes like this, a place that someday may be known 
as the spot that home construction changed forever. To best understand the sea change happening here in Georgetown, Texas, consider Lennar, one of the largest home builders in the United States, has teamed with the inventors of this giant printer, an Austin-based tech company called Icon. I believe we are on the brink here of doing something very special, something very innovative, and no one's ever done it, no one's ever built 100 homes uh, with 3D printers. It's also unusual that 3D printing a house? Well, I know it sounds unusual, but this technology is actually one that's existed for a while. Dimitri Julius is one of the brains behind this tech that allows for walls that are curved, even wavy if you want, and at the same time are so incredibly solid. So that means something like this can withstand potentially uh, hurricanes is, a, is an interesting use case. We're currently building houses on the Texas Gulf Coast, thinking specifically about uh, the durability of a concrete material. If all of this sounds like it's out of this world, like something from the Jetsons, then you're on to something because... Three, two, one. NASA, which just launched Artemis to orbit the moon this week, is working with ICON. We, we are planning on putting a 3D printer on the moon with NASA. And beyond? That's the hope. Mars? That's the dream. Mars. Someday, printed homes up there. But first, here on Earth, the test homes have shown they're more energy efficient and usually quiet. The walls, they feel a little bit like corduroy. A printed house, what maybe one day future generations will find commonplace. My son's uh, 15 months old. Will this be routine when he's 15 years old? If it is, we've succeeded. back with the Boost and the Outstanding Mature Girls Organization, also known as OMG. This group is instilling confidence in young women and girls through mentorship and community service. Check it out. This is Sashika Bonchamp. Born in Trinidad, she's now a Baton Rouge, Louisiana inspiration. Miss Sashika is amazing. She's so hardworking. She's always running. She's doing something. Miss Sashika is like another mother to me. Yes, in these neck of the woods, she's kind of a big deal. She has really like shown me how to have confidence in myself. She extends beyond extension. Anything for the kids, and I just love her. The former radio show host, known for her affectionate smile and loving personality, is the founder and president of the youth mentoring organization, OMG which stands for Outstanding Mature Girls. Whether you are a scholar or whether you're struggling in school, like OMG is the place for you because we teach those girls who are scholars to be able to help pull their sister up. 10 years ago, Sashika created the nonprofit which serves girls ages 9 to 19, offering leadership training, mentoring, and community service. 
OMG has given me a continuous sisterhood, but it also has helped me to break out of my shyness. It really helps me feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. They all are there for each other, and they just all want to just do right and, and be leaders. Shakita Maiden credits OMG for helping her daughter, Anaya. She wasn't smiling, and I was wondering why. So I used to get in trouble a lot, get suspended and stuff like that. When I came to OMG, it was like a sister. It helped her to get in a safe space where she was able to talk and vent and cry and be consulted and not be judged. And it helped her to develop a self-confidence. How has OMG changed your relationship with Anaya? We are closer and so, it's okay, it's okay. I just thank God that it saved her. Sashika often reflects on her own childhood struggles using her story to uplift others. I felt like I had to put a mask on. When I went to school, I had to be somebody else. What made you feel like you had to be somebody else at school? Being bullied and picked on for how I spoke, my hair. So I went home and I wanted to cut all my hair off because it was something that drew attention at school. For the wife and mother of three, launching OMG was a lifelong passion. Today, OMG has eight chapters across the state of Louisiana with about 200 members. Everything was funded out of my pocket, or should I say my husband's pocket, <laughs> and just small donations. And that's how we have survived. People think that we get so much money and we don't. We just, it's just the, the community coming together and just helping and to make it great and to make sure that these girls have the best experience ever in what we do. What do you think your teenage self would think of you now? I knew you can do it, Sash. Like, good job. And continue just like leading and lighting the path for others. And that's what I want to do, just light that path. And now it was our turn to brighten up everyone's day. And Miss Sashika, where are you? I interrupted a round of games for a special surprise for Sashika. Today, it's time that we recognize you and all you do for the community. First, the mayor of Baton Rouge, Sharon Weston Broom, gave a proclamation. I just want to commend you and celebrate you for all the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Then, four of OMG's smallest members helped us deliver one big surprise. Wells Fargo was so impressed to learn all the work Outstanding Mature Girls is doing to set up young women for success. They will be donating Ten thousand dollars. So OMG can continue with that. I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful because I don't get this quite often. So I'm very grateful for it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. OMG. Now we are stepping into a very special dance studio to find out about a sisterhood built on movement and empowerment. NBC's Blaine Alexander has this next story. Five, six, ready, move. It hits you as soon as you step through the doors. The swag, the precision. We keep the game lit. No, y'all don't. No, you don't. Because if you did, it wouldn't sound like that. And it doesn't come by accident. We're gonna do some sit-ups, we're gonna do some push-ups, we might do some waltzes. This is boot camp. <laughs> it's a stepper's boot camp, yes. Welcome to DSSD Dance Studio, the soulful brainchild of Coach Latata Wallace. Tell me about this place, because as soon as I walked in, I felt the energy. I just feel like the energy has to be perfect, not just for me, but for the kids as well. So this really is a sacred space for them. It really is. And for you. And for, and, and for me, yes. <laughs> In fact, it's built right into the name, DSSD, Daughter, Sister, Stepper, Dancer, named for the bond that Latata herself longed for as a child. I took everything that I didn't have when I was a kid, I created it here at DSSD. Growing up in Decatur, Georgia, Latata was in and out of school and in and out of trouble. My mother was young, my father wasn't active, I remember more bad than I do good. But in seventh grade, she found her safe space in two very special coaches. Together, they introduced her to the world of stepping, and she was hooked. 
as I'm stumping and I'm hitting these moves, I'm feeling the positive energy go through my body. I'm leaving the, the trauma and the drama and everything I've been through, like it's leaving me. It was like therapy for you. Yes, it was definitely therapy. Soon, it became her mission to give that medicine to girls just like her. Latata started as a middle school teacher with a step team on the side. It wasn't until she was laid off in 2016 that she pursued the business full time and DSSD was born. Today, the studio has more than 100 steppers, nearly half a million social media followers, and enough trophies to fill a dance floor. But her steppers say the real reward is what happens here. What is it that kept you guys coming back? Each the, other? Yeah, yeah the, the team, bond. the sisterhood. OJ, Alana, and Jamaria have been at the studio from the very beginning. What do you think is the biggest thing that you've gotten from DSSD? It helped me come out my shell. And now I perform in front of a bunch of people and I never would have thought I would have done that. There's little girls that act like me, that think like me, that look like me, and I could be that person to them. Oh, confidence. Because Laura knows I would never be sticking my tongue out every two seconds if it wasn't for this. <laughs> and for Latata, that's what this space is all about. I have stopped a cool kid from committing suicide. Mm -hmm. I stopped kids from running away because I just let them know, hey, it's not cool. I've been there. I've done that. It doesn't mean she's not tough. Latata's standards are sky high. Ready, hit, move. Even with the least experienced steppers. Yes, what? Yeah. Latata says she can make a stepper out of anybody. I so I thought I'd put that to the test. That's it. You got That's it. it. <laughs> Up next, another group of women taking some big steps forward in the name of sisterhood. How they are part of a special movement spreading to cities all over the country. And trust me, when they go on a walk, you can't miss them. If you would have told me 250 people would come to a walk in New York City, I would have never believed you. <laughs> Every walk is a good walk for Brianna Cohn. It's one thing to go for a walk or go for a walk with friends, but you turned this into something huge. I was feeling a little lonely, a little isolated, and I was like, what if I posted on my TikTok? What if we did a walk club where we just like drink our coffee, we chit chat, we leave our worries behind? The 28-year-old fitness trainer, who had already amassed millions of followers across TikTok and Instagram, asked her community if they would join her for a walk around New York City's Pier 45. People were like, oh my God, I want to join. This sounds amazing. Like, people were sending it to their friends, and I was not expecting that. I was expecting like 10, 20 people. On her first group walk back in March of this year, more than 100 women showed up for a stroll, and City Girls Who Walk was born. How would you describe perfect walk? You listen to that feel good music and you just get lost, lost outside, lost in the time and just a quick like 30, 30 minute walk. That's all you need. Brianna didn't want the walking group to be a huge commitment. The plan was once a week for a 40 minute walk. That's it. Some girls like go to brunch after, some just hang out and chat. What is it about walking with others? When you're walking by yourself, I feel like so many thoughts come into your head, but if you walk with someone else, you can kind of forget all of that and just talk about life and just like feel that connection. The event blew up on social media with hundreds of women showing up week after week, forming a sisterhood in the process. So who goes on these walks? Who's walking together? It ranges, not kidding, from like 18 to 65, 70. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Soon, women in other cities like Philadelphia, Boise, and Phoenix were creating their own branches of City Girls Who Walk. What's some of the most meaningful feedback you've received from this? I actually pulled up one of my favorite quotes that somebody said to me. They said, City Girls Who Walk has changed my life. It is so, so much richer and more full of love with dear new friends in a season when I really, really needed them. I can't thank you enough. How so does that make you feel? It's, it honestly, like, it could bring me to tears. Like, it's helped so many girls, and that's exactly why I started it.
to the boost. Most people are adults by the time they earn a degree, but this next young man is about to do it at the age of 12. And he's not getting just one degree, but five. Macy Jenkins with our Los Angeles station NBC4 has this story. For these Civil Air Patrol cadets in Chino, it's all about learning the basics. They get leadership out of this. With a shared dream of becoming a pilot. Yes, sir, man. And for 12-year-old Clovis Hung. I expected to get my license at 16. It's next on his to-do list after he becomes the youngest person to graduate from Fullerton College on Saturday. I'm going to graduate with five degrees, associate degree in history, associate degree in science, uh, social science, uh, science and mathematics, arts and human expressions, uh, social behavior and self-development. In 2019, Clovis left his second grade classroom bored and ready for a bigger challenge. I wanted to be in college because I was really curious at a really young age. That curiosity led him to enroll in Fullerton College in 2020. They asked me questions like, how old are you and what are you doing here? So I'll just answer them. I'm 12 and I'm taking classes with you. And he's done it all with mom Song Choi by his side. He loves studying. Actually, studying is his hobby. Her incredible baby boy fighting against the odds since the very beginning. When he was born, he was very incredible because uh, he was a premature baby. And he was born at the 27th week, less than two pounds. Choi, now beaming with pride, says she hasn't forgotten. Clovis is still just a kid. I'm not a tiger mom, no. Yeah, actually, it's the opposite. Sometimes I just need to remind him to relax, take it easy. Outside of the classroom, he's a Boy Scout and loves basketball, archery, and traveling, visiting 23 countries so far with his family. I study a lot so that I could get a lot of things done before I play. As part of Squadron 20, the studying continues. Follows directions well. He's learning. He's trying to grow. And Clovis says the number one thing it takes to succeed is a healthy dose of self-motivation. What I do is that I tell myself that I can do it. You can keep going. You did a very good job. We've got a few more academic superstars on our hands. Triplets who've dubbed themselves overachievers, overcoming the odds to make graduation day together. Colleen Williams, also with our Los Angeles station NBC4, has this inspiring story. I'm Ireland. I'm Smith. I'm Kayla. They are the Shoot family, or Team Shoot, local triplets graduating from USC. But the journey to get them here required teamwork, akin to the Trojan football team in their very best year. For the past 21 years, they've been almost inseparable graduating together from La Cañada High School, and except for a brief period during COVID, always in the same zip code. Seconds apart at birth, their personalities couldn't be more different. You know, I'm calm, obviously. I'm the talker. Smith's, he's president of the USC State Club. He's also doing pre-med, so he's kind of in that realm. Ireland, she's or she does rock climbing, she's very outdoorsy. Their journey to get to this day, to graduation at USC, with them all in sync, has been nothing short of extraordinary. Ireland Smith and Kayla lost their mom to cancer when they were only 15. A single mom who they say worked 80 hours a week to provide, from her they learned hard work and perseverance. And did I mention, they're all graduating with honors. Uh, Smith and I will both be graduating uh, summa cum laude, and Kay will be graduating magna cum laude, and I'll be graduating with communication honors. You get the drift. Ireland, Smith, and Kayla are smart, driven, and not afraid to take on the world. Getting to this point would not have happened without their Trojan family and their adoptive family, Chris and Joe Lee. Most amazing people. On planet Earth. Exactly, our guardian angels. Yeah, I think they, in many ways, saved our lives and they changed the trajectory of our entire life forever. The couple and their two children became instant family, officially adopting the triplets in 2019. To this day, I'm not totally sure why they decided to take a bet on us and <laughs> bring, in, bring us into their home, but I'm so glad that they did. They're some of the kindest people I've ever met. They're hilarious. They're just fun to talk to. And this picture of their mom graduating from this very same spot at USC in 1997 has always been great motivation. We overachieved our way here and we're all going to walk together and I would like to think that she'd be proud of it.
We are back here on The Boost with that one last feel-good story for you. Check it out. A man named Scott had just uh, a Father's Day he'll never forget. So his dog passed away a few months back, and he'd been wanting a new companion ever since. Well, on Sunday, he got his wish. It's his day, babe. I don't have a dog yet. Dang it! <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> we got you one, Scott. There he is. It's a big boy. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That right oh, there. Oh, that. oh, oh my goodness. Oh. Okay, that's love at first sight. Really perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Man's best gift. friend. There you go. There you go. Yeah, there it like is. The old koala hug. And that's oh, so that's cute. Right. You know what? Oh, and, and, I like the quiet boost. Yeah, yeah and the dog, sometimes you, you just got to take it in. It's yes. beautiful. The little pup. It's oh, a special yeah, yeah. moment. Oh, really, really, really Very nice. Sweet. Well done. They don't all have to be standing ovations. No. You know? It's like very heartfelt. Sweet. Love that. Well, thank you for joining me for another uplifting episode of The Boost. We hope to help you keep those spirits lifted up all day long. And we will see you right back here tomorrow on Today All Day. Vicki Wynn, thanks for joining us for Consumer Confidential Summer Safety Edition. Now we're going to talk about keeping safe this summer, but we're also going to tell you how to save on summer essentials. With inflation reaching record levels, we'll give you some tips to make your money work. But first, the Consumer Product Safety Commission says drownings usually spike during the summer, but these accidents are preventable. Here are some simple reminders. The unmistakable sound of summer. Kids playing in the pool. But without proper attention, fun can quickly take a tragic turn. On average, more than 900 kids die each year from drowning in the U.S. Drowning is the leading cause of unintentional death among kids ages 1 to 4. And it's not just pools you need to be worried about. Ponds like this and other natural bodies of water can also lure kids. So we brought in Mary O'Donohue. She's the Senior Aquatics Director at the YMCA to talk to us about some basic summer safety tips. It takes as little as 20 seconds for someone to go under the water and not be able to get back to the surface. There are some basic tips that you can evaluate uh, how your children are comfortable in the water. Okay, I have my three girls waiting, eager to get into the pool, so let's go. We are all suited up, ready to go. Emmy and Odessa, they're older, they know how to swim. Renly does not know how to swim yet, and this would be their first swim of the season, so what should we be doing right now? We're gonna look for a Coast Guard approved life jacket for non-swimmers, and you're also looking at the weight category. So this looks like it will fit her, it's 30 to 50 pounds. Okay. You wanna make sure it fits snugly. How does that feel, Boo? Good? Next, the big girls are up for a quick water competency check. You want to make sure that they can independently submerge in the water. When they come back up, that they can turn around and look to see where the safest place is to get out or grab a hold of and be able to climb out independently. Check to see if they can swim the length of the pool and ask them to tread water for a minute. Lay down. Okay. 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 So, Mary, what if you have a child that's not uh, really into being in the pool? And that's fine. Just let them be comfortable in how they are. Sometimes it's just sitting on the wall, putting their feet in. Having the uh, Coast Guard approved life jacket on will ensure that if they do get into the water, they're going to be safe. Pool toys are fun, but they can also be dangerous because they block your view of who's in the water. It doesn't look like there are any kids in the water right now, but there are. So, make sure you take the pool toys out when you're not using them. It's also important to have a sturdy gate with openings that don't allow little ones to slip through and you wanna make sure the gate is self-locking. And don't forget kiddie pools and above ground pools. Experts say children can drown in as little as an inch and a half of water. So empty those smaller pools after using them and remove the ladder from larger pools. And no matter what kind of water the kids are in, always designate a water watcher, an adult assigned to watch the kids at all times tips to keep your family safe while swimming this summer. 
Now, even if your child is a good swimmer, fatigue can kick in. So set a timer to remind everyone to take a break and importantly, hydrate. With more on summer safety, NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Today. So Dr. Azar, let's talk about heat exhaustion. Yes. Let's get an idea of like, what are some of the warning signs we should be watching out for? So the number one thing, Vicki, is that people can either pass out or they have a core body temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. Most of us don't have a digital thermometer on board, so other signs and symptoms to look for would be uh, confusion, headache, lightheadedness, dry skin. People think a lot, well, if you're overheated, you're going to be sweating a lot. Mm. No, people who have heat exhaustion will actually have very red, very hot, very dry skin. That's a very good clue. For. Okay, so if you see someone who is experiencing that, what should you do? So the first thing to do is move them into a cool area, so a shady area under a tree, air conditioning if you can. We have some props with us yeah. here. Yeah. If you have the, um, uh, if you're near ice packs, let's say you're at a picnic yeah. or something okay. like that, the places to put them under the neck under the arm, in the groin, those are areas where a lot of blood vessels, that can okay. start to cool the temperature down. A big misconception is that you put people in an ice bath. Uh -huh. We don't want you doing that unless it was someone who has exertional exhaustion, meaning like a, a, an athlete who did a vigorous workout. Mm -hmm. They can go in an ice tub. Nobody else should go into an ice tub and call 911. You should actually do that before you start initiating first aid because it is a medical emergency. Okay, that's good to know. So let's talk about prevention. How do you prevent yourself from becoming overheated? Well, it's really about dehydration. Mm -hmm. So obviously, sun exposure is the big one. And I think people often think, well, I'm just going to drink a lot of water and a lot of fluids, and that certainly can be beneficial. But you can also eat foods that have a lot or a high water content. Yeah. We're talking strawberries, uh -huh. peaches, lettuce in salads, watermelon, yeah. celery, cucumbers. What to avoid? Alcohol is a big one. Alcohol definitely dehydrates. And we have here our good old Yeah, what about show. coffee? So we did think for a long time that caffeine acted as what's called a diuretic. Uh -huh meaning that it made you pee a lot yes. and that you would lose fluid that way. You really can't dehydrate yourself with caffeinated beverages really? on their own. Right, so if you're drinking an iced coffee, there's a lot of water in there too. So that's you okay. Enjoy your caffeinated beverages, but just keep an, keep an eye on how much you're sweating and how much you're taking in. And make sure you drink more water for alcohol. That's like an important rule, right? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Alcohol in the sun is just a big no-no. I know, and but that, it mixes a lot during the summer, so people it gotta pay really attention. Does. Let's talk careful. about this, the debate over spray sunscreen versus is cream sunscreen. Yes. Is there a difference and is one better than the other? Right. So if you ask, most dermatologists will say the best sunscreen is the sunscreen that you actually apply. Mm. And you know this, mm -hmm. Vic, my kids are a little older now, yeah. but trying to have your fidgety kids stay still to apply lotion is not that easy. Right. So for a lot of us moms and dads out there, it is easier to spray. Okay. Spray is fine as long as the spray is actually getting onto the skin. So be aware of, of wind and that kind of thing. Yeah. I like to apply the spray and then make sure that you rub it in, but it's just as good. SPF 30 or above. Okay. Reapply every two hours. Reapply, especially if you're doing vigorous exercise and, and sweating. sweating or mm -hmm. swimming. Every time you come out of the pool, you have to reapply. Let it sink in for about 15 or 20 minutes before and you go back in the sun. If you're spraying, make sure you do it outside in a well-ventilated spot. In a, a well-ventilated spot, yes. Okay, and I want to mention, obviously, you talked about you have we have hats, and of course, that sun protective clothing is important, too. Very, and you want to do, generally speaking, like colored light, okay. weight, hats, that kind of thing. If you can look through the piece of clothing, that's not thick enough, oh, right? You want to be able it's, it's okay. like you want it to be more opaque, mm -hmm. light colored and light, but still that you can't see the light through it. Then you know you're pretty well covered. Dr. Natalie Azar, you are the best. Thank you Thank for covering you so sun much safety for having with us. us. Good to see ya. All right, well, still to come from grilling to fireworks, hacks to keep your family safe all season long, and later, save or splurge, how to stretch your dollars on summer necessities. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh. You deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker.
Well, one of my favorite holidays, 4th of July, but before you do anything, some must-see safety tips and hacks to make sure everyone has a great time while staying safe. It's the 4th of July, and that means summer. Time to head outside and enjoy the weather. And if you're like me, there will be a lot of grilling happening in your house, but are you using one of these to clean your grates? Well, the metal bristles work great for cleaning, but they can also come out of the brush and get stuck in your food. So here is a fantastic alternative, an onion. Yeah, an onion, check it out. It works really well to get all that gunk off of the grates. And if you don't have an onion, another quick, easy trick, aluminum foil. Just take a ball and get to scrubbing. Also, as you're getting ready to grill that meat, make sure you keep it refrigerated. The USDA says anything that's uncooked left out for more than an hour in this summer weather could make you sick. Serving adult beverages at the party? I like to use two different color cups, red ones for the grown-ups and the alcoholic beverages, blue ones for the kid-friendly drinks. There you go, ask me. That way, there is no confusion. And it just wouldn't be the 4th of July without fireworks. If you're heading out to a big show, it's gonna be amazing. But one thing's for sure, it's gonna be loud. And if you are bringing your little ones, don't forget the ear protection. I like these ones, they go over the ears just like this. Jay's helping us out. Those feel okay, Jay? Awesome. And if you can't find those in time, well, these work just as well, the traditional earplugs. Now let's talk about the at-home fireworks. So much fun, but they can also be incredibly dangerous. So before you light off those one, two, three goes or the Rainbow shower, wow, this brings me back. Make sure you've done your homework. Fire extinguisher at the ready, have it out, know how to use it. And don't forget, sparklers, very fun, but even something as small as this can start a big fire. So have the bucket of water ready, and when everything's done, extinguish it, and you're safe. And of course, check to see if it's legal to light fireworks where you live. Here's a great tip for when you venture out into the crowds for fireworks. Use a temporary tattoo with your name and phone number so if your child gets lost, someone can call you right away. And you can get this temporary tattoo paper online, print it out at home, that's what I did. If you don't have time for that, permanent marker works just as well. Pool parties are always fun, but here's some tips. Be sure to designate a responsible and sober adult. I'll take that, thank you to watch the pool. As an additional safety measure, there's a number of high-tech tools that can help you in case of a potential pool safety incident. There's this bracelet by Safety Turtle, and it will sound an alarm the second your kid hits the water. And this is super loud. There's no way you're gonna miss this alarm. And it works for your pets too if your dog is not a strong swimmer, right, Peanut? And you've definitely heard this before, but don't forget about the sunscreen. Reapply that sunscreen about every hour. We all have our phones with us all the time. Just set a timer, easy reminder. And a great rule of thumb for exactly how much sunscreen to use, the experts recommend a shot glass full. But really, you can never get too much. And just a reminder, every year animal shelters see an influx of pets who get spooked by the fireworks and run off. So make sure those tags on your pets are updated with your correct phone number and address. And also just keep your pets inside during the fireworks. All right, when we come back, your summer shopping guide, where to find the deals and later how to host the hottest summer get togethers. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all.
are back with our Consumer Confidential telling you what to buy in the month of June and what you may want to skip to save some money. So here to break it down is our senior investigative and consumer correspondent, Vicki Wynn. Vicki, good morning. Good morning, guys. So they say June is a good time to buy for dads, yes. graduates. Is that true? I- First of all, yes, and also, Father's Day is coming up. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Come out. Father's see, you Day. See that that was, oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. oh, it's Father's Day. This segment. Greeny didn't oh, put that on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what else is modestly priced right now? Okay, we'll talk about dads and grads. Let's start with grads. Craig, you wanted to ask, is cash okay? Cash is always okay. Yes. I think we got to transition you and wean you off of gift cards. And the reason why, there's $21 billion in unused gift cards right now sitting mm. in American households. $21 cash, billion? cash always gets spent. $21 billion. The average person sitting on $175 in gift cards. Mm-hmm. So if you want to give cash to grads, they're always going to be able to use it. If you have a grad that's really into DIY, summer is the time when everybody's getting out there doing those projects themselves, dads as well. So tools and gadgets tend to go on sale. Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Sears, those are all great places to find all of those little things that you need or a tool set, a tool box this time of year is great. The other thing that goes on sale in June is athletic apparel because Mm. January is the big push, new year, new you. June, the weather is great again, (laughs) so look for uh, Adidas, Nike, Puma, the typical places, but also lots of deals, buy one, uh, buy more, save more type deals at places like JCPenney and Kohl's on shorts, tank tops, all the things you need for that summer refresh. I hear some people are training for a marathon. So this is a good time for you, Chanel. There you go. Get yes. some new sneakers. And then think about it. You're outside. So first aid supplies, go and check that kit in your car, in your medicine cabinet. Oh, Make sure everything is, is fresh, up to date. The Band-Aids are still sticky. Amazon last year had 50% off of Band-Aids and Neosporin and all that good stuff. So you want the, those things on hand for right, sunburns so, and bites. So what are some of the big sales, big ticket items going on? Okay. So Bath and Body Works, they, they call it the queen of June sales because that's when you get all your lotions, your potions, your soaps out. This is the time to stock up. Body Shop also huh. does a sale up to 75% off oh, Bath wow. and Body Works. And the hack from the crazy coupon lady is if you sign up for the email, you'll get those coupons mailed to you. That's typically a sale that's better to do in store because those items are heavy. So if you have to pay for shipping or a minimum purchase, you'll get better deals in store. Okay. All right, uh, video Vic- games is the next one. 90% right. off of PC games. Oh. Steam and GOG look for deals starting mid-June and late June that go in to July, Humble Bundle and Ubisoft. I think they're trying to get people from outside to come back inside, so oh. this is the time, up to 90% off of those uh-huh. those computer games. And then Pet Supplies for Pepper and uh-huh. my dog Moose. Chewy has their- What's kid. your dog's name? His Moose. His name is Moose. He's, he's little, <laughs> but you know, big and But mighty. Spirit. Yeah, <laughs> tiny but mighty. Um, Pet Supplies, Chewy has their huge sale in June, up to 50% off, not just for dogs and cats, fish, reptiles, that guinea okay. pig you've always wanted. Oh, right? yes. And the farm animals as well. All right, finally, are there some items that maybe aren't Uh, a good time to buy? I guess they're most affordable at this moment. Yes, you want to hold off. If you haven't gotten your air conditioner for the summer, this is not a great time to get it. They're going to go on sale again July, August, September. Brand name clothing, if you're into it, Nordstrom has its big anniversary sale. The previews start June 29th, uh, but you want to wait until July 15th because that's when the sale actually kicks in. Mm. For anything that's high-end, brand name, that's when you're going to see the big sales. And then on your bigger ticket Amazon devices. Like Alexa? Like Alexa echoes those kinds of things prime day is coming christmas in july trey bodge our smart shopping expert predicts it'll be the second week of july so don't buy that right now but if you want to get your dad a tablet or some kind of device Mm -hmm. this could be a good time for father's day all right vicky thanks so much we love our dads this morning on today's checklist we are focusing on summer medical travel safety as we enter prime vacation season with all the time and, and energy that we spend planning the actual trip it's a good idea to prepare for injuries and illnesses as well so we brought in an expert dr kavita agarwal is a board certified in internal medicine dr kavita good to have you good back good morning hi thank you for having me uh-huh. so before we hop on that plane or hop yeah. on that train or hop in the car you yeah. say that it's a good idea to talk to a, our doctor and our pharmacist why Absolutely, because think about this, you want to have a summer vacation without getting sick, right? We want to have a fun time. So what I would recommend is checking with your doctor first. And what they can do is just make sure that you're up to date with your routine vaccines, like the flu and the tetanus shot. And then also your childhood vaccines. You want to make sure that you're up to date with your chicken pox and your polio, mumps, measles, rubella, because there are some areas around the world that have pockets of those infections, and that way you'll be safe and protected. I'm looking, go ahead. I was going to say, and also with your pharmacist, you 
can ask for certain kinds of prescriptions? Um, you, they can give you some recommendations, you know, for over-the-counter meds, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I think when you speak with your doctor first, they will review which country you're traveling to, okay. and they will review the CDC's recommendations just to make sure that if there are any infections that are brewing in that pocket of the world, that you are safe. So, like, if you're going to the tropical areas, you may want to take bug spray to prevent mosquito-borne infections mm -hmm. like chikungunya, Zika, dengue, malaria, or even Ooh. antibiotics. All of those mm -hmm. things. Yes. I'm looking at this next um, uh, this next list here about what kind of documents you need. And I have to be honest, before you travel, things I haven't really thought about, like bringing some of your health documents. Yeah, you so if you have any important health documents, make a copy. It's so easy these days. You have a phone, you can take a picture of it, bring it with you. Um, things such as your COVID vaccine cards or some countries that may still require that. Um, and if you take any regularly prescribed medicines, your doctor can actually prepare a health summary that includes your medical diagnoses, your surgery, right, your medication, the, in the allergies. language where you go. Yes, yes, not just in English, but in the language of the country that you're and traveling that's to. So right. interesting. Yes, and your doctor can review your meds just to make sure that they're approved in the country you're traveling. I will tell you, if you've ever had to go to the hospital or go to a doctor in an emergency in another yeah. country, I had to do that once. It's scary. It is you don't scary. really have. You think you can just pull out your insurance card? It no, just doesn't work that way. No. So on that note, you say yes. to consider yes. traveler's health insurance. Absolutely, because the insurance that you buy here doesn't really typically cover care abroad. Yeah. And if you buy it, then at least you'll have affordable health care while traveling. And I, I've also understood that sometimes you might want to, depending on where you're going, you might want to think about evacuation insurance as well. Because and usually that's covered with your travel insurance. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, good deal. Absolutely. Masks have been, some people are wearing them. Mm -hmm. I've been traveling a lot. Some people aren't. What is your rule with that and some other general rules? I think now it becomes a personal decision. Talk with your doctor about it. I think if you have chronic conditions that put you at risk for respiratory illnesses and complications, you may want to still wear the mask when you're indoors and in close quarters. But people say when you walk on the plane and when you walk off is when you should wear it, but when actually you're sitting on the plane because of the filter, it's oh, actually... Oh, the filters are really good. The air circulation is good. It really reduces the risk of infection. Okay. Absolutely. What are some other general rules? Um, so if you're going on a long journey, um, something that is like a very long car, plane, train ride, sitting for prolonged periods can cause your blood to pool in your legs and you could be at higher risk of blood clots. So the way to prevent that is get up like every two hours or so mm -hmm. and stretch out those calf muscles, go for a walk. Um, also want to stay hydrated because it's summertime, right? Yeah. You could be out in the sun, you're on the beach, going for hikes, stay hydrated. Um, skip risky foods. Mm, um, yeah. If you're going to be in an area where you don't know about the water, if it's safe, yeah. mm. I say you stick to bottled water, mm -hmm. skip the ice. We've all been yeah. there. Oh my yeah. gosh, you don't yeah. want to be sick while on vacation. <laughs> it's good. Um, wash those hands. Too. Wash those yeah. hands, yeah. get right. the street foods. Long absolutely. flights I wear up. Compression socks. Oh, they help. They yeah. help definitely. That's, that's yeah, helped absolutely. Because well, then I've had absolutely. blood clots. Yeah. So, yeah. what about what are some of the uh, the over-the-counter medicines we should be bringing with us? And I definitely recommend taking them from here because once I was in Paris, my son got sick. We went in, and everything's in French, and you don't, yeah. you don't even know what's yeah. what. So it's you want to have meds that you know and are comfortable with. So the things that I pack and like to take with me are motion sickness meds, your anti-diarrheals, your cold and flu meds, um, pain All relievers, things. cold um, sleep aids. You know, because mm -hmm. especially in a it's very hard yeah. to sleep. Sure. And if you got a, a red eye, you want to be refreshed the next day. Um, and also going back to the bug spray, you want to choose something that is EPA registered and that way you know it works. And sunscreen, don't forget yeah. the sunscreen. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. This makes your trip a little always. smoother, and, you know, yeah. when you have these things. Yes. Good yes. advice. And also with the over-the-counter meds, the nice thing is that if you're trying to take your carry-on mm -hmm. and not, you know, bring a checked-in luggage, they come in these foil packs that are slim yes. and then you can avoid the liquids and just uh -oh. stick to the tablets so Thank you don't you. get stuck at security. Well, coming up, hacks to make the most out of summer from staying cool to being the hostess with the mostest. Consumer Confidential is coming right back.
right now that we know how to stay safe and what to buy and when to buy it, let's take things to the next level and make the most of what summer has to offer with hacks for staying cool and how to host the hottest get together. Melanie Berlier, the Spruce Group General Manager, she's here now to help us maximize our summer. Okay, welcome Melanie. I'm going to bring us over here. Start off with uh, talking to us about these products and how can they help us with our summer plans. There are so many underrated ways to beat the heat this summer. When it comes to energy efficiency, one of the simplest things you can do is swap out all of your old bulbs oh. for the newer ones because they're more energy efficient mm -hmm. and they're not going to emit any heat throughout your home. Nice. So you save money on the bill and they're cooler. What about these devices here? The so the dehumidifier comes in handy because your air conditioning unit is working really, really hard to cool the air and remove moisture from the air. But if you have a dehumidifier oh. on site, the air conditioner isn't going to have to work as hard. Nice. Oh, I love that. Okay. And then finally, talk to us about the pillow and sheets here. Sure. So bedding is super important when it comes to your temperature control, mm -hmm. which impacts your quality of sleep. Yes. With a cooling pillow, you're actually going to remove heat from your body and get a better night's rest oh, during I like that. Yeah, it's so important to sleep yeah. with a cool pillow. And at the Spruce, we recommend really lightweight, 100% cotton sheets for the summer months. Okay, excellent. All right, my family loves to be outside. We can't wait to get out there, use our backyard. Tell us about different things that we can do to stay cool, stay hydrated, and have a good time. Sure, so a DIY bar cart is one of our favorite oh, things. Oh, that's a great it's idea. So easy to do, and it's a fan favorite. So you just need, in addition to the bar cart, you need a beverage dispenser mm -hmm. to display your batch cocktail of choice. Mm -hmm. You need super durable tumblers. Forget glass outdoors, please. Yeah. It's much safer to go with a durable plastic. And then you're going to want an ice bucket. If you're feeling next level, throw some succulents on there and a bowl of lemons and limes. And staying hydrated is important, so getting a big size, getting everyone the liquids that they need. All right, Absolutely. let's talk a little bit about staying safe when you're in the sun. We talked about sunscreen earlier, and I think that's so vital. Yeah, one of our favorite things is that we recommend a sun protection station. Mm. You're going to want to include sun hats, sunglasses, and sunscreen that your family members or visitors can choose from. Okay, and then finally, the sun goes down. You still want the party to continue. That's kind of the most fun because then it's cooler. Yes. What are some things to help us get through the summer nights? So we love lighting, wicker lanterns, string lights are beautiful, but when it comes to insects, uh -huh. an insect yes. repelling candle is going to do double duty as both a source of warm, cozy vibes and a bug repellent. Okay, and you know what we did? We bought one of those giant outdoor fans, which really helps to keep the bugs away as well. Yes, those are a great idea too. I love this wicker lamp. All right, Melanie, what about outdoor movies? That's becoming more and more popular. Backyard movie theaters are so easy to create and they're fun for literally everyone of all ages. All you need are a screen, mm -hmm. a projector, an audio system, a content source, and a few cables and wires. <laughs> You're like, all you need are these seven things. <laughs> but they're, they're pretty affordable these days, yes? They really are. And aside from the technical aspects, all you want to think about are food, seating, and maybe some mosquito netting. But Definitely. Everyone has fun in a backyard movie theater moment. Melanie Berlier, thank you so much. So appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, that is our time for all of us here at NBC News. I'm Vicki Wynn. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. In the meantime, stay safe and cool. With the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on. It's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, 
our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots, taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do. Diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown Expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England. As they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance, and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted, but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> 
Now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples, and that's it. Where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago. And that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily. And I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves. I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid 20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall. There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> My family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you-pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards 
all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay. Right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes free. Okay. So that means that it's ripe. Okay, and the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we we treat these like eggs and oh. we place them in place the bucket. Place them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the Honeycrisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was going to look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about, OK, are you going to come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this will be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Right. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together. American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers. And our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells the story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it. And she would bake it in the oven just along with hers and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. 
funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. Once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity. She just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. Honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old, proving it's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so Thank you. much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough, so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of uh, flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hands. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody <laughs> loved them. Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. It's the best boss. No, everything I do is very, how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May. But her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> now it's very, uh, it's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations.
make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank you. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy, candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them, and then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You could do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you, love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in Candy Apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely gonna support it. It's gonna become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmers markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating and it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dip treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival. The turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. 
We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away and after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed and we weren't expecting that of you know either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by. That we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Mm -hmm. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. Good Wednesday morning. No relief from that extreme weather coast to coast. Yeah, tens of millions bracing for yet another brutal day. Good morning. It's July 12th. This is Today. up. It's been 100 degrees for like, what, two weeks almost? 